everyone. We'll get started. Uh, as you join, if you could mute yourselves, we have right now we're at 105 attendees and I expect that will continue to grow. But if you could mute uh, yourselves as you come in, we have um, several presenters today. You'll just want to make sure that you unmute to the extent that um, you have any problems. I'll try to help. We have um, experts on the line too who can help us. So thank you. Okay. I want to just um, make sure that we have a quorum before we get started. And for those attending, this meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Here. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, here. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Zuniga. Here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And then Commissioner Stevens. Here. Good morning, everybody. There you are. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you. Given the unprecedented circumstances resulting from the global current coronavirus pandemic, Governor Baker did issue an order that gives limited relief from certain provisions of the open meeting law to protect the health and safety of those who are interested in attending our public meeting. Keeping with the guidance provided, this meeting will be conducted utilizing remote collaborative technology. If there's any technical problem, I just want to let folks know that we will give guidance on our website, massgaming.com. Thank you, and I'm going to call to order this meeting. It is public meeting number 303. Today is Thursday, May 21st, 2020. It is 10.05, and I welcome all of you, and thank you for joining us. Um, we'll get started. We have a full agenda today. We, of course, will just keep in mind um, those that we have lost in Massachusetts. We are now over 6,000 due to this coronavirus. So we are thinking of all of their families and all of those who have worked hard to have um, provided care. Thank you. Um, item number two, Commissioner Stebbins. Good morning, Madam Chair, my colleagues. Uh, in your packet, you have the minutes of the April 29th uh, 2020 uh, commission meeting. I would move the approval of those minutes subject as always to any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Any questions? Oh, sorry, did we hear, did, did you have a second, Commissioner Cameron? I did, I just unmuted myself, second. Thank, Thank you, you. Colonel. <laughs> any questions or comments? Thank you, and of course, thank you to Shara. Um, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stevens. Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you. Madam Chair, we also have in the packet the uh, meeting minutes from the May 1st, 2020 meeting. Uh, I would move their approval subject to any corrections for typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Do I hear a second? Second. Any questions or comments on those minutes? Hearing none, Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. I vote. Yes, thank you, five zero. Finally, Madam Chair, we have the uh, meeting minutes from the May 7th, 2020 commission meeting. I would move their approval subject again to any uh, changes for typographical errors or any other non-material matters. I have one non-material edit and it, uh, it is at the bottom of page nine, commissioner update. Um, uh, the International Gaming Association. It, we, we talk about the, uh, the two associations. Could we just add joint conference? So we know that we're talking about a conference, not the organizations themselves. Will do. Sure. Thank you. On that note, I second. Thank you. Any further edits or comments? Always comprehensive, thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. 
I vote yes. Thank you. Five zero, sure. Thank you. Moving on to item number three. Good morning, Karen, our interim executive director, Wells. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Uh, for our administrative update today, I just want to give you a, a preliminary update on not only our office reopening, but also uh, casino reopening plans. Uh, we recognize that the governor just this week gave substantial guidance on office reopenings in Boston and across the Commonwealth. And notable in that guidance is that, uh, quote, workers must continue to telework if feasible. So we've taken that to heart given the success of our teleworking operations at the MGC. There's really no immediate need for our staff to return to our offices at the present time. Uh, we also want to be mindful of conserving resources, such as cleaning supplies, masks, and gloves for other state agencies that will have a more immediate need to open and return to their offices. Additionally, we recognize that uh, employees may have concerns over such things as utilizing public transportation, and we want to minimize uh, anxiety if pushing the return is not necessary, as it is with us. Uh, so once the casinos open, we will need to have a presence on property. So our team is working on internal procedures consistent with the governor's directives for the safety of our gaming agents, game sense advisors, racing employees, and others who are expected to be on site once the casinos open. Uh, full office operations, those won't, that won't need to be addressed uh, until after the casino openings, and we're expecting an incremental approach to that process. So that's where we are on the office reopenings. Does anyone have any questions on that? I know uh, Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner Stebbins are working closely with uh, us on leading that uh, internal working group team on those office reopenings. So if, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise I'll go uh, move on to the casino reopenings. I, I just have a, a follow up. Uh, so yes. with respect to the guidelines that you're gonna be issuing that will inform everyone on the reopening, those will be issued in, will uh, Commissioner uh, Cameron, uh, Commissioner Stebbins, and you, Karen, come bring them forth to the commission? Is that the ultimate plan? Exactly, so that the, the public will be aware of what we're doing, what our, our capabilities are, and that um, the whole office will be aware. We'll have internal meetings, uh, probably an internal town hall to talk to the staff about that, but my expectation is we will discuss the whole process for office reopenings and what we will and will not do in that incremental approach uh, that provides safety for the employees at the MGC. Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner Stebbins, did you wanna add at this point? Um, I, I agree that I know we have another meeting, I believe it's Monday, to continue to refine and uh, be educated about, about uh, the governor's instructions and our planning process. And I do think the town hall has been an effective way to notify staff about exactly what is going on. And that information is critical because it does, um, it does tamp down anxiety the more good information people have. Commissioner Stevens, I see you nodding your head. Do you want to add in? Yeah, no, just to just to thank um, Interim Executive Director Wells uh, and, and the team she pulled together to work with Commissioner Cameron and I on this. Um, great sources of information coming from the governor's office and the state HRD department, which I know uh, our CFAO Lennon has been uh, closely in contact with so it's uh, it's been great information information that i'm sure a lot of employers are going to have to follow across massachusetts so um appreciate the good team that uh, has been working on this to get everybody back safely excellent thank you uh, as for the casino oh pardon me and commissioner zuniga yeah i was just gonna um echo that uh, that uh that comment and uh, I mentioned that um, it's very preliminary, but uh, we might expect some incremental costs to come from um, reopening. Uh, the building manager uh, has proposed a number of uh, things that they would have to do. Again, this is very much in a state of being um, ironed out. Uh, and. Uh, and you know we'll have to come back with uh, those updates as as necessary. Correct. 
Absolutely. And and I know that Joe is working with the building, yes. correct? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Joe's been fantastic on that. Go Joe, ahead. did you want to add in? I saw you leaning in. All set? Okay, he's got mute. Okay, so uh, as far as the casino reopenings, obviously we got tremendous guidance from the governor's office on what the plan is across the Commonwealth uh, earlier in the week. And we will be following the governor's guidance on that phased approach to reopening of businesses. Uh, so right now, uh, we are in that phase three uh, through the governor's plan and we'll continue to monitor what that guidance is. And then at the same time, we will be continuing to evaluate the casino's COVID plans, which you discussed at uh, one of the last public meetings. And we will be providing guidance and direction to the licensees based upon those governor's mandates, the other state and federal requirements, expert public health guidance, and also lessons learned from other jurisdictions that will open before Massachusetts. I think that's going to be very interesting for our team to look at what uh, positives and negatives come out of other casino reopenings. So that whole uh, approach will be going on over the next several weeks while we wait for that phase three uh, to be implemented across the Commonwealth. So that's, that's generally where we are there. We're, um, continue work internally, but you know, if any, any questions from the commissioners, I'm happy to address, uh, but that generally is the plan for both the internal and external opening processes, our offices and the casino. Any questions for Karen on that? Okay, I'll set Commissioner Brent. All right, thank you. Anything further? No. Okay, I'll set then. Um, we'll move on to, Item number three, four, excuse me, and this is um, with respect to our legal and licensing divisions. Uh, again, Interim Executive Director Wells, Mr. Grossman, our Interim General Counsel, Loretta Lilios, Chief Enforcement Counsel and Deputy Director of IEB, and then Joe Delaney, our Construction Project Oversight Manager, and Bill Curtis, our Licensing Manager. I think that we'll hear from all of you with, with respect to Plain Ridge Park Casino licensing renewal status update. So thank you. That, that's correct, Madam Chair. So I'm going to turn it over initially to uh, Loretta Lilios and Joe Delaney uh, to start off the, uh, the, the briefing for you and where we are with the Plain Ridge Park Casino renewal. It's amazing to believe that it's uh, the five years is coming up since they opened. Uh, so I'll turn it over to them. The staff has been working very hard and very efficiently, and it's another example of how the remote teleworking has actually been chugging right along and been very effective because this whole process continues to move along despite the office closure. So my compliments to the staff on moving along with that. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, Ms. Lilios and Mr. Delaney just to give you a brief update. Uh, thank you, Karen, and good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner. So Joe and I are here to report to you on the status of the renewal process for the Category 2 license. As you know, the initial license commenced on June 24th of 2015, the date that the Commission issued the operations certificate. And under Section 20F of the gaming law, the term of the license is five years leading to the expiration date of June 24th of this year. On February 28th of this year, we sent a letter to PPC notifying them in writing of the procedures for renewal that the commission voted to adopt at its meeting on February 13th. And the February 28th letter itemized the materials that PPC would need to submit to comprise its renewal application. The, this itemized list covered about two pages of the seven-page letter, and obviously from the timing of the letter at the end of February, it was only about two weeks later that the property closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And despite the fact that these unprecedented circumstances have created some challenges to PPC in gathering some of the mater application materials, Nonetheless, PPC is well underway in this process. We've been in frequent communication with them about their submissions. They've provided a schedule for submissions of the material that is still outstanding, and they've informed us they, they expect and intend to provide all of the materials in advance of the 
uh, June 24th date. And this would be important because under Chapter 30A, Section 13, the statute governing the Commonwealth's administrative procedures, if a licensee has made timely and sufficient application for a renewal, the license shall not expire until the application has been finally determined by the agency. So Joe and I would like to update you now on the status of the required items. Uh, the, the first uh, batch of materials are related to the suitability of the licensee and the associated qualifiers. We worked with Penn National Gaming and with GLPI to coordinate the submissions from the corporate qualifiers. And I can report that all of the suitability related application materials for both the individual and entity qualifiers have been submitted. I do want to acknowledge the degree of responsiveness and priority and the attention that the company is given to completing uh, this has been extremely high. Uh, so I wanted, wanted to bring that to your attention, um, even while dealing with the unfolding uh, challenges, um, uh, they have been extremely responsive. The investigators have conducted all the required interviews with the qualifiers, and the qualifiers have also completed all of the supplemental uh, submissions that our investigators asked for. In fact, with respect to the individual qualifiers, uh, the IEB has completed the suitability review under the procedures that you directed. Uh, with respect to the suitability review of the entity qualifiers, the reports are in their draft form and th those drafts are coming under review at this time. So the bottom line with respect to the suitability aspect of the renewal application is that PPC has satisfied all of the submission requirements. And of course, once those reports are finalized, we'll bring them forward for a suitability hearing and a determination uh, by you uh, by a vote on suitability. Um, my uh, intention, even uh, pre-COVID-19, uh, was to complete that uh, in advance of the June 24th date. Uh, I have, I don't want to um, totally commit, but I have not abandoned uh, that expectation uh, at this time. Um, so that's the summary of the suitability status. I can uh, turn to Joe to give you details uh, on the other applications. And just before we turn to Joe, uh, do we have questions for Loretta right now uh, before we turn to Joe? Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, so just uh, expanding on what Loretta said, you know, we did receive um, a large tranche of information from PPC on April 15th of 2020, um, which addressed many of the items that were required in the February 28th letter. Um, after we took a look at all of that information, we did realize that there were some uh, gaps in uh, that information. So we reached out to the folks at PPC and uh, we've been uh, dealing mostly with Lisa McKenney on this. And, you know, I think the real issue that PPC is having in pulling all of this information together um, is a couple of issues. One is that um, some of the responsible parties for this information have been furloughed, so they are physically not there to, to do the work. Um, and then the second uh, part of this is that even if there are some people that are working there, uh, some of them are just trying to keep things running. And just as an example, um, with the remaining uh, HR staff, which is very minimal. Um, they've been dealing with issues primarily around things like unemployment insurance and trying to keep uh, the, the employees, you know, a, a, a money stream coming in for those folks. Now, of course, those same people are responsible for the affirmative action programs, the affirmative marketing programs, the tourism programs, and some of those other things that we require. So it's, you know, they have a balancing act of what's, you know, what's priority one, sort of what's priority two. Um, of course, with that said, um, you know, a lot of this work 
that we're still waiting for a lot of these things that we're waiting for. A lot of that work was done back when we did the so-called midterm review, uh, you know, which I think we did actually really about a year ago, year and a half ago. Now, of course, all of that information that we had at that review still needs to be updated and, and, and so on. But we have that. So we know, you know, we know that these things are in process. Um, and then I think the other thing that you need to remember is that, you know, most of the information that we're requesting are really summaries of work that was done over the five year term of the license and the current status of compliance. And I don't want to suggest at all that, you know, PPC is not performing these activities on site or, you know, certainly were when the facility was operational or that the MGC staff is not monitoring or overseeing the, these activities. And again, just as an example, let's take internal controls. We know that PPC has a full set of internal controls because we reviewed them and we continue to review them when they modify them. And uh, the gaming agents ensure that they're being followed. So, you know, these activities are ongoing. What we're asking for them are these summaries of the activities that took place over that five year term of the license. So I just want to put that in, in context a little bit. Um, so how do we move forward on this? Um, Loretta and I met on Monday um, uh, with Lisa and went over every single thing item by item of what is left to get to us. And she pulled together um, a schedule uh, on getting us this information. And essentially what they've done is uh, said they be, they'll get things to us in, in two big batches of information. One on or about June 1st, and then the second uh, on June 15th. And that would complete all of the things that we have asked for in uh, the application. Now, of course, the commission has meetings on June 4th and June 18th. So when we get these in, this information, we should be able to keep the commission regularly updated as that comes in. We could come back on the 4th and give you an update and then come back on the 18th again and give you another update. Um, now, of course, Assuming that we get everything that we need by June 15th, there'll really be uh, precious little time between then and the 24th to complete all of the other things that we need to do, to hold a public hearing, uh, to review all of the submitted information. And you know, there's an assumption there there'll be follow-up questions with the licensees. We have to draft a new license with new permit conditions and so on. So there's still a lot of work to be done even after we have all of the information that we're looking for. Now, um, and also uh, this could, and I'm going to stress the word could, uh, coincide with activities leading up to the reopening of the casinos, which will complicate matters even more than it, than it already is. So now as Todd has explained to me, and I think Loretta alluded to this at the beginning, um, once, and, and I'm going to make sure I get the words right, uh, the appropriate words, once the commission determines that an application is timely and sufficient, the onus is then on the commission to complete the work of relicensing, to do those things we talked about, the public hearings and so on. Um, now, if that work isn't completed by the 24th of June, the license would then simply continue on until such time as the commission acted on the license. I think it's, it's somewhat analogous if you have a professional license. Uh, in my case, I have a professional engineer's license. If I submitted all my paperwork to the state and they did not act upon that, that doesn't mean that my license expires. It means it just continues on until they, they do act on that. So I guess all of that, you know, if the, we could probably, if we get everything that we need to get, uh, on the June 18th meeting, the commission could then determine that the application is sufficient. And then we can develop a reasonable schedule for completing all of those other activities depending upon what our situation is on June 18th, which we, you know, as we found out over the last few months, we never know what's coming up in a couple of weeks ahead. So I think that's about where we are. And there's one other, other item I'm gonna bring up, I'll kick, and then I'll kick it back to Loretta to talk about this a little bit more. One of the things that we did require in our application is the payment of the renewal fee. Uh, PPC has not paid that yet. And I think Loretta's had some conversations with them about that and, and I think they're going to look maybe for some temporary relief on that uh, so that the payment doesn't have to be done up front but will need to be done uh, 
you know, before the license is reissued. So Loretta, let me turn that back to you and you can talk about that. And then I think we can open it up for questions. Sure, sure, thank you, Joe. Um, so the, our February 28th letter states that proof of payment of the fee is one of the application requirements. This is not a statutory or a regulatory requirement. It was something that you decided uh, to put, have us put in that, in that letter as a prerequisite. Um, uh, PPC uh, has indicated that they may request in the circumstances that instead of making proof of payment a prerequisite to the completed application, that the payment be required at a later date, uh, perhaps in your conjunction with your consider actual consideration of the uh, application. Um, they have, in our discussions, they have not put in that formal request yet, but I expect that they, uh, that they will. Um, you would, again, you would have discretion uh, with respect to the timing of the payment. Um, and I would suggest at this point that PPC submit such a request and that you could uh, consider it um, at your June 4th, at your June 4th meeting. Loretta, can you remind me um, where that fee lands and which fund, or if Derek's on the, um, on the line, if he could chime in. It, it goes into the gaming revenue fund. That's my, yes, that's, that's my understanding as well. Thank you. I apologize, Chair, I was on another call. What, what was the question? I think we've got an answer from Commissioner Zuniga. Oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. Any questions for Loretta and Joe? I, I just had. Oh, you, okay. Commissioner, Cameron, Commissioner Cameron, please. Okay. Um, I just, it sounds like uh, both Joe and Loretta, you are um, confident that uh, all the information you need for that application to be sufficient will be uh, in the Commission's hands by, it sounds like, the 15th. Listen, they've made it a very high priority. It is, you know, clear to us that they have every intention of uh, having a complete uh, packet as soon as possible. So I have uh, no reason to uh, call that into questions. Great, thank you. I think one of the key considerations also is that they want to get this stuff to us so that this does not conflict with the reopening of the facility. Yeah. They're saying they don't want people running around trying to get affidavits signed when they're trying to reopen a property. So they're saying, let's get this behind us and then we can focus on it. Yeah, thank you. I, I, was, I was just gonna make a, a, a comment uh, about things like that. Um, to the extent that we can insert some flexibility, and I know we're not, uh, we're not inflexible uh, relative to information that we have maybe seen versions of in the past. You mentioned, for example, the affirmative action program, and uh, and we have reasonable assurances that maybe nothing much has changed since we last saw it, and we can get either an affidavit or a certification or a statement to the you know to the effect that uh, there has been nothing substantial that we can at least deem it um, uh, you know, complete for the time being uh, and, and, and revise or review uh, any information after that. You know, if there's information, of course, that we have never seen, that may be go without saying that that attains a higher priority, uh, but I think we have had uh, quite a bit of information uh, from that mid-year review uh, and, and other things along the lines, certainly throughout the five years, uh, in terms of compliance and whatnot, um, to be uh, uh, to be reasonably confident that they can attain these um, these deadlines. I think that we gave some good guidance when we decided about the renewal process that allows us to rely appropriately. Um, on on those past practices, is that correct, Loretta? Um, the directives that that we gave earlier to guide this process for you. 
I think that's accurate and just in the nature of the items that are required in the application, many of them align with that midterm review. Um, so in that regard, I, uh, you're correct. Right, and, but the main thing we wanna do is give very clear um, assurances to the company that as of June 24th, they have made a license application, renewal application that is timely and sufficient. There can't be any ambiguity for them on that. Oh, correct, correct. That's important, very critical for their, for their purposes. Um, so to the extent, Joe or Loretta, there's anything in your gut that you think you know, really would be concerning about that sufficient piece, I know that you'll be on top of it. Absolutely. Yes. Excellent. Any further questions for Lavetta and Joe? Excellent. Thank you for that update. Thank, Thank you, Karen. you. Karen, is there anything else on that that we need to add, Todd? No, I don't think so. We I mean, we have Bill and uh, and Todd on the on the call in case you had any questions on that. But the, the team does seem to be working very collaboratively with the licensee to make sure that this is done properly. Bill, do we have any concerns about renewals of liquor licenses? Do we have to worry about anything on that front in order for them to be? No, Chair, we don't. We have um, the liquor license will run out um, June of um, 2021, so oh, um, they're still in compliance with that. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We can move on to item number five. And uh, Joe Delaney, you're back on. And I know that oh, Mary, Mary is there somewhere too. There she is. Thank you so much, Mary Thurlow and Joe Delaney. Thank you on, on our community, community mitigation fund summary update. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, again, I'm here with Mary Thurlow. Um, and, uh, you know, just before I get started on the update, I just wanted to uh, thank the whole review team that we have here. Everybody has really gone over and above on, you know, doing this work remotely and trying to get all of this done. Um, They've taken a lot of the responsibility uh, for, for doing the reviews and other things. So it, it's really been, it's been a great process so far. You can uh, name their names if you want, Joe. <laughs> you have everybody's, um, yeah, everyone's names in front of you? Yeah, I do, as a matter of fact. Um, nice. So yeah, on our, on our review team, of course, there's myself and Mary, uh, but we also have uh, Com Commissioner Stebbins and Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, we've got Carrie uh, Teresi, uh, Kate Hardigan, um, Jill Griffin, Crystal Howard, Teresa Fiore, and Tanya Perez. Um, so everybody, like I said everybody's doing a really great job. So uh, I really do appreciate it. You have uh, excellent extra hands there. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so just there's a lot of information in your packet and obviously I'm not going to go through all of this because it would be uh, it would take far too long to do so but I just wanted to give you a high level view of sort of where we are today um, and some of the uh, challenges that we have in the next several weeks um, so we got our applications in on February 1st of uh, 2020 on or before that we got 37 applications that totaled about $13.4 million. Now, if you remember from our guidelines, we had targeted a total of $11.5 million for grants. We have $6 million for Region A, $5 million for Region B, and we put aside $500,000 for the Category 2 uh, uh, licensee. And so right off the bat, you'll see that we have more applications than we have available funds. Um, and also, if you recall, we, we did agree that the money that was generated in Region A would stay within Region A, and the money generated in Region B would stay within Region B for a period of, of three years. So, um, so we're constrained a little bit with that. Now, on, in your um, packet in the memo, you'll see that uh, in Region A, we had applications of over $9 million. Mm -hmm. We 
means that, that region A is oversubscribed by more than 50%. Uh, region B uh, is a little, uh, little under $4 million. So from just a pure money standpoint, we're okay there. And between category two and the tribal reserve, we have uh, $282,000, which is well within that $500,000 that we set aside for that. Um, so now that obviously gives us a, a challenge on uh, Region A to, to get, you know, to review these uh, projects to get everything to fit. Um, now that also doesn't mean in Region B just because there's enough money available that all of those grants will be awarded. We still have to do our reviews and make sure that they're eligible and they, they have a nexus to the casino and so on and so forth. So all of that process is still underway. Now, the other piece of this is we have sort of a second constraint here where we set targets for certain categories of grants. So uh, some categories don't have any targets. The specific impact grant doesn't have a target and the non-transportation planning grant doesn't have a target. But for instance, our transportation planning uh, grant has a target of a million dollars and uh, we've received applications of over $2 million. The transportation construction grant, which is the new program for this year, uh, we targeted $3 million and we have applications of 5.7 million. So, you know, the long and short of it is, is that uh, in doing these reviews, we're gonna have to make some difficult recommendations to the commission, and the commission is gonna have to make some difficult choices on on what grants to fund. Um, so as of right now, we have gotten our, all of the applications in. We've done our initial reviews of those applications. Right now we're in the midst of our, our meetings with the applicant. So we meet with each applicant and ask them questions that have been raised on the review of the applications. So those um, meetings actually finish up tomorrow. Uh, we've met with MassDOT and we've got a letter of, uh, of comments from them on the pertinent applications. And we are still awaiting uh, letters from our licensees on the applications. Those are due back to us on Friday. So once we get all of that done, we get our, our meetings done, our letters done. So next week we start our serious evaluations of all of this. So we meet a couple times a week. And we're going to go through these one by one and do they meet the eligibility requirements? You know, which are the strongest applications within the categories? So, um, you know, this will be a, a bit of a challenge, I think, for the uh, review team. You know, in years past, we have, um, we've not run into this issue with, with money. Um, we've always had enough money available to fund the applications, the eligible applications that came into us. Again, that's not to say we didn't eliminate some applications because we did, you know, due to eligibility concerns. Um, so anyway, we have our work cut out for us. Um, and what right now we have two meetings, two commission meetings scheduled, one on June 18th and one on June 25th to consider these applications. We're hoping that those two meetings will be enough to get through all of this. I think if, you know, certainly if it's not enough to get through that, we can extend this out into July if we absolutely need to. Um, but obviously our target is to try to get this done by the end of the fiscal year, which is state keeps in accordance with our schedule. And um, it'd be nice to have it done at the end of June, like we said we were going to even given the circumstances we're in. And with that, I guess I'll open it up to any questions. Questions? Uh, this is more a comment that uh, that has been um, made um, that we've made aware, and Joe has been very good about explaining to the people that we are uh, dealing with that I think is relevant to talk about now at a high level, and that is that even with the targets, even if we met the targets that um, that Joe described. Um, because of the casino's closure, the next year's targets are, uh, it's probably safe to say that will be, there will be less. Um, because there's been no money coming into the community mitigation fund 
you know, since uh, May, uh, the middle of May, when uh, when the, when they ceased to operate, um, and um, and we just really don't know uh, how, uh, if, if and when they open, whether the level of activity would be similar to what we were seeing uh, before. Commissioner so, Zucca, can I ask this question? Yeah. So, if um, Region B is um, the, the applications right now come in um, about a million dollars under the, the five million dollars that had been targeted for Region B. Does that million carry over to next year? Effectively, yes. Uh, you know the way we've set it up, yes. And 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 when is the end of the in the three year period? It would be it would stay with Region B, correct, Joe? Yeah, that's correct. So what what it so the first year where the casinos were generating money, we had some money that was in the fund from the license fees and so on, but the actual money that's being generated by the casino is kept in, it, in its own region for a period of three years. So we had the money that was generated um, in calendar year, like for, for the Western region, 2018 money, then yeah. we had an entire year of 2019 money, and then we have now what's coming in and what came in in early 2020, and then what will come in the rest of the year. So we're going to have a we're going to have a hard time estimating. It's going to be hard to estimate. Yeah, yeah. The but what we can do is we will do those estimates and we'll say, all right, if if they underexpend it, let's say for the sake of argument, uh, we have four million. We we gave out four million in grants and we had five mil million available just to make the numbers easy. Yeah, that million dollars would roll over. So uh, chances are you know, the Western region would have a little bit better financial situation than the Eastern region by rolling over those funds. And, you know, and when do we have to generate our rules for next year? Is it October? Yeah, we start generally in September and uh, we usually finish up our guidelines right about by the end of November so that okay. we can get our, our, get things out to our applicants by December 1st and that gives them two two full months to get their applications together. So we're going to be well hopefully by you know that time period we'll have some idea of you know the casinos will be back open and we'll, we'll be generating we'll have an idea of how much money they're generating whether it's 25 percent or 50 percent or whatever it is of the the number that was being generated before you know I guess we have no way of knowing yeah. Thank you. Other questions for Joe um, and Mary? Uh, Madam Chair, um, just, a, just a couple of points. Um, and I want to thank Joe and Mary. They've kind of, you know, picked up the ball and kept running with this process um, seamlessly. Um, it was interesting to note that nothing, and, and Joe will correct me if I'm wrong, nothing came in this year that was deemed an emergency impact, something that Required the commission's uh, review and uh, an assessment immediately. So um, I think that speaks to you know how we have how our licensees, how our hosts and surrounding communities have all tried to adjust to what the uh, expected impacts of the casino were going to be. Uh, I like the fact Joe has led off every conversation with uh, getting feedback from the applicants as to what impact. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis might have on their application, especially if there is a municipal match or a municipal contribution to the project. So I think that's been helpful. Um, the, the, the one place that um, we've encouraged uh, our two workforce training applicants were, uh, would they have any interest in reassessing their proposal? understanding that what they filed by February 1st may be completely different than what the workforce needs would be coming out of coming out of this pandemic crisis so all of our you know our two workforce applicants are certainly thinking about that and responding to that um, also in one other final point kind of looking forward is uh, especially if this becomes a lean, uh, revenue year, and it will be, thinking ahead to the guidelines and policies for next year, should we address 
pulling back reserves that have not been used that were allocated over several years or what we might do with awards that were made in the past that have not gotten to for any number of reasons not gotten to the starting point so i think those are questions that you know the commission you know come this fall might want to think about uh, but uh, just again, kudos to Joe and Mary and the rest of the review team for the great work everybody's been doing. And you too. Thank you. Any other um, questions for this team? Commissioner O'Brien, are you all set? No, I don't have any questions, thanks. Okay, excellent. Commissioner Cameron, all set? Uh, I don't have questions, but I would like to thank the team. I realize by all of the submissions we receive uh, how much work goes into this process and how thoughtful they are about equity and what really, um, you know, ma making sure that these applications meet the, uh, the criteria and sending letters back to give them additional information. So I do thank the entire team for the, for the work that goes into this. Yeah, let me just second that. And, uh, you know, it, uh, as, as has been articulated here, there's a lot of uh, these grants that are very worthwhile, even in the face of a changing circumstances, uh, like Commissioner uh, Stebbins was saying, because of this pandemic, uh, the challenge will continue to be how to manage the program overall uh, and try to, uh, uh, try to plan for the future as well. Any further questions, comments, any follow-up, Joe? Are you all set? I think we're all set, thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you, everyone. And Mary, are you all set? I can read your lips, because <laughs> thumbs up. Thank you so much. We're gonna move on now to um, item number six on our agenda. Today, um, we are going to hear from um, our uh, independent monitor that the uh, Gaming Commission selected at the conclusion of our um, hearing on the win matter last, our hearing and decision last spring. Um, we, uh, I want to uh, thank Monitor Alejandra Montenegro, um, Alamonte, Deputy Monitor Preston Pugh, and um, um, Ann Salton, who joins them today, and the entire team at Miller and Chevalier, who probably is also on this call. Um, you know, you you were selected based on many, um, based on established criteria, and it was a competitive process. And uh, uh, so much had to do with the fact that you had such a um, extensive, experienced, and diverse team. So we thank you. Uh, at the onset, I just want to note that you have provided us today with, um, and, and with Wynn, um, a comprehensive and constructive baseline assessment <clears throat> after uh, six months worth of work as we requested in our decision. And it appears to affirm Wynn's sincere commitment to HR compliance and confirms an evident change in organizational culture at the company's highest levels. We appreciate the thoroughness of your report. That report is, of course, posted on our, um, on our website now and is available along with your PowerPoint, which we will hear from you shortly. I also want to acknowledge that uh, while our, our colleagues from Wynn um, are, are not going to join today for a presentation, they have submitted a response that also is posted on the website. So with that, Good, um, good morning. This You did not have to travel from Washington, D.C. to meet with us. Um, so we have spared you some air travel, but we are here virtually. I'd love for you, Alejandra, uh, to introduce your team and then um, get started. I do want to invite my fellow commissioners to interject questions along the way if you think it's going to be perhaps more productive. Um, sometimes we wait but this is a, a lengthy um, report and a lengthy PowerPoint, and it might just be more meaningful even for our virtual attendees and presenters to have that um, exchange. So please interject, but we will also, of course, reserve uh, time for questions at the end. So thank you and good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's wonderful to see you all, at least virtually. 
Um, we want to start by thanking you again for the trust that you've placed on, on our team for this very important project. It has been um, a privilege to, to serve in this role and we appreciate that opportunity. Uh, I do want to start by introducing my team and uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate for you recognizing those members that are not uh, presenting today, but I would like to start with Preston Pugh, um, who has, uh, who's deputy monitor on this project, and Sultan, who's another one of our partners and has had a very strong leadership role given her expansive uh, compliance experience. I'm not presenting today, but certainly worthy of gratitude and recognition, Catherine Pappas, Aisha Hussein, Nicole Gokshabai, and Alexa Zhao and Mary Lou Soller, who have also participated extensively um, in, this, in this exercise. So thank you for them. This report and this entire presentation would not have been possible without them. I would also be remiss not to thank the company for their cooperation in this exercise. As you noted, it was a very extensive work. Um, and we do appreciate the cooperation and collaboration that they demonstrated throughout this entire project with respect to our document requests, making individuals available for interviews, even during the pandemic. And I, I should stress that despite the disruption that the company has faced both in Las Vegas and in Boston, they continue to demonstrate the collaboration that we've experienced since the beginning of this in September. So I do appreciate that very much. And please do interject. Um, we do have a lot to say, and, and this is much more dynamic, I think, for everyone involved if you do ask questions as, as we go along. We're, we do have a presentation that we'll be able to project, so everyone who is watching the video will be able to follow along. We'll do our best to cue where we are as we move along. Um, but Anne, if you wanna get us started with that, thank you. We'll start by giving you um, a roadmap. We're gonna start just with a high level introduction of what the goals of our baseline assessment were, just to remind us what we discussed back when this uh, monitor should begin. A summary of our review and testing activities so that we all have an understanding of what the procedures here look like. Overall observations, and then we'll go into a bit of the company's risk profile, which helped inform, of course, our review and assessment. And when we began, we identified what the key hallmarks, as we call them, were elements of an effective compliance program are. So we will go again at, at a high level, um, what the general observations and recommendations are of the team with respect to each of those hallmarks. We'll conclude with our overall takeaways. And we, we have reserved time for, for Q&A, but as we've said, please do feel free to interject with questions as we go along. When we met, uh, before the monitorship began, and Anne, we can move to slide three. Alejandra, just so my fellow yes. commissioners know, I can't see all of your faces always, so to, you know, don't be shy, just interject, okay? Thank you. Thank you. When we first met, we explained the goal of this assessment was to ex evaluate the company's current human resources compliance program, which we refer to at times as the HRCP to ensure that as currently designed, the program is tailored to the company's operational and uh, human resources risks so that it can effectively prevent, detect, and respond to those risks, particularly of harassment and discrimination to ensure that the well-being, safety, and the welfare of the company, its employees is being protected. So to do that, we have outlined, as we've said, the key elements which we draw from compliance resources such as the EEOC and the DEOJ who've got who've given extensive guidance what an effective com compliance program should look like and these are the 10 elements that we will walk through with you starting with culture um, highlighting some of the ones that are most critical to our assessment here culture independence and authority um, third parties and internal investigations were some of the areas that we spent most of our time during this first six month period evaluating. Anne's gonna walk us through what the process looked like, um, and then we'll continue with, with uh, more observations. Anne? Thank you. Um, so we took very seriously the mandate in the decision order that the monitor conduct without limitation a full review and evaluation of all policies and organizational changes adopted by the company and certain business practices as relevant to the company's HRCP. In conducting our baseline assessment, 
we closely tracked the work plan that we had set out for you back in the fall. Um, and so I'll just briefly go through what our process was now. For those following along on their own copies of the materials, we are on slide four now. Um, our fact gathering process consisted of three broad steps. The first was requesting and reviewing documentation. The second was conducting interviews of company employees. And the third was conducting focus groups. This was coupled, of course, with real-time analysis and then a broader analysis of our findings at the end during our drafting phase. In requesting documents from the company, we asked for a variety of materials, including training materials, board and board committee agendas and minutes, the company's HRCP-related policies and procedures, vendor onboarding documentation, policies related to the use of external legal advisors and investigation files. And as Alejandra noted, the company was cooperative with these requests um, and we reviewed over 300 documents that they provided for us. With respect to interviews, we conducted 27 individual interviews and interviewees included members of the Compliance Committee, Senior Management at Wynn Resorts, at Anchor Boston Harbor, and at Wynn Las Vegas. We also interviewed individuals in functions that are relevant to the HRCP, including human resources, employee relations, legal, compliance, and security. Overall, we found interviewees to be credible and forthcoming, and we appreciated their um, participation in our process. We also conducted 32 focus groups covering 200 employees. 113 of the employees were in Boston and 87 were in Las Vegas. Our approach to focus groups was to have small groups, sometimes sorted by department and always by position, to keep um, line employees and managers separate and encourage as much of a discussion um, and as open of a discussion as we could. Um, so for example, we had some focus groups at Encore Boston Harbor and Wynn Las Vegas that were sorted by department and some that were um, cross-functional so that we could get a sampling of multiple different departments. We tried as much as possible during the course of the focus groups and interviews to verify the information that we were receiving from individuals um, throughout our discussions. We also importantly asked all focus group participants to complete an anonymous survey on the HRCP program, their perceptions of it, and their personal experiences with HRCP matters. And we appreciated the employees' willingness to do that. So in the report, we do cite to some information learned from focus groups or certain beliefs held by employees who participated in our focus groups. And obviously we heard a lot of individual stories during the many discussions that took place. But for purposes of the report, we uh, really focused on the details that we felt were representative of the messages that we heard from multiple individuals um, through the course of the last six months. And then of course, after our fact gathering was largely complete, we sat down to synthesize what we had learned to put that into the report. And Alejandro will talk a bit about our overall observations. Thank you, Anne. I wanna highlight two, two issues, not two issues, but two points with respect to the focus groups. Um, it's important to note the focus groups were entirely voluntary. Um, we worked with the company as to who generally the categories of employees that we wanted to speak to uh, also gave our input on the communication around inviting those employees to the focus groups and we confirmed the employees that participated did so entirely voluntarily and willing to share which, which really added to the candor and dynamic discussions that we had. As Anne noted, we did hear many different voices. We heard from employees who had very positive experiences, very positive um, things to say. We had other uh, voices who expressed different experiences. And part of what we're gonna continue to do in the remainder of the monitorship is to, is to pressure test a bit whether some of those uh, employees that were voicing less positive experiences are outlier or individual circumstances or whether they speak to issues that will continue to be a focus of, of the monitorship. But for purposes of this report, as Anne stated, we did approach this uh, thematically. Themes emerge across properties and across focus groups and that's what we will be incorporated into the report. So based on that, um, the really overall observations, and Madam Chair, as, as you noted, we did go in with a, a priority to test what the current culture is 
at Wynn and Encore, both in Boston and in Las Vegas, with respect particularly to harassment and discrimination compliance. The events that preceded the MGC's decision and order occurred at, at the very top, and you could argue were isolated to a smaller number of individuals at the top of the organization. That said, in our experience with these types of matters, even though conduct might be contained, it does have an effect of permeating an organization in ways that isn't always tangible and clear, and that takes deliberate steps and time to shift. So it, it was a, a, a true priority for us to test, not just through interviews, but evaluating the conduct of the current leadership at the company to really test the sincerity of the commitment to the HR compliance program. And as we noted in our report, we do perceive a sincere commitment to HR compliance, and more importantly, a sincere commitment to reshifting and redefining the culture um, at Win and Encore with respect to harassment and discrimination. The way that this is reflected is, as we walked through the hallmarks that are essential to a compliance program, we do see the indicators that each of those elements is currently present in the HRCP. It's already incorporated in the company's human resources compliance program in varying degrees of development and maturity, of course, as you would expect to see. But the fact that the company is already making steps in each of those columns is to us an important indicator of, of its commitment to these issues. That said, we do make recommendations to help the company continue to tailor and mature its program. What we're seeing right now is what we would expect, the development of a more robust program that still needs to continue to internalize and reflect the specific operational and, and, and human resources compliance risks that the company faces and to align to enforcement guidance, right? So not just uh, legal obligations, but enforcement guidance that pushes companies to do to do more to ensure that its employees and its risks, that its risks are mitigated and its employees are, are fully protected. Um, so with that, we will move now to what those risks were that we evaluated as we were beginning the monitorship that helped assess, uh, helped inform rather our assessment with respect to the effectiveness of the program. Preston? Thanks, Dr. Um, and, and I want to echo your your thanks uh, both uh, uh, to the Madam Chair and the entire uh, commission for for the opportunity uh, to work uh, with you and, and with uh, Wynn um, on this engagement. Um, to be very brief, um, we we talked about context, and you recall that in the beginning when we interviewed with you, uh, we talked about context. Um, um, uh, risk factors, as you see on this slide, right, um, 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 inform the context in which companies uh, both create and implement uh, the human resources compliance program. Uh, and, and going into this, I think uh, uh, both uh, the commission and uh, as a monitor team, we, we understood that there were certain factors, risk factors, that, uh, that this uh, um, setting had that this particular employer had in this particular location. We also, as Alejandro said, looked at uh, Las Vegas. Our men of force were uh, conscious of the industry too. So what we have listed here on slide six, for those of you who cannot see it, um, are a number of, of, of risk factors. Um, um, risks that we knew about include, for example, uh, coarsened uh, social disc, uh, discourse outside the workplace, and that's particularly something that happens in, in Las Vegas, but can happen in, in uh, Everett as well. Um, uh, workplaces with significant power disparities, also something that we knew about, uh, just because uh, you have a variety of different levels and you have a, a core group at the top that controls very much, and of course, the, some of the historical issues stem directly from uh, these power disparities. Um, workplace culture uh, that tolerate or encourage um, alcohol consumption. We know certainly that uh, uh, this is an industry that, in, that, that tolerates alcohol consumption. Uh, people are, are um, uh, 
participating in the games at, at all hours of uh, the day and night, uh, and, and, and alcohol is, is served. Uh, so that is something else that, that, that creates, that adds to the context we described. Um, another risk that we knew about was workplace culture uh, uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, another, another uh, issue that we knew about was an isolated workplace. And I think that we've, we've talked about this in the past, but um, by isolated, here we mean, uh, um, are there parts of this particular um, site of this particular employer that um, there's only a, a few employees who are working and maybe not in the line of sight of um, uh, the, the uh, most senior authorities, right? So there are a variety of areas in this um, expansive facility uh, that um, can be isolated. And the question, of course, then is, all right, well, what is the company doing to make sure that uh, its, its HRCP is being followed even in those areas? And not just with, with respect to its employees, but critically, and we'll talk about this more later, with respect to um, third parties and, and other and, and patrons and, and people, other people like that. Um, another risk that we knew about, of course, is that the um, uh, company uh, has, has been in uh, crisis management mode uh, for, for some time. And of course, um, the, 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 the question there then is, as so many employers are facing now, are the are the 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 measures that are being taken to fix the problem um, taken so, solely with respect to the short term, or or are they sustainable over time to make sure that these issues don't come up again? Right. Um, a few risks that we didn't know about, but because of the focus groups um, and interviews that we've done, um, we're we're now educated about them. Um, workplaces that rely on customer service or um, and, and client satisfaction, obviously. Uh, when takes very seriously its uh, uh, obligations to, to client satisfaction, it is key. And as you've seen us describe in the report, it is, it's central. Um, that in it alone is, is great, right? But that also needs to extend to um, not just the way the clients are, are, or patrons are treated, but also how employees are treated, and not just by other employees, but also by customers. So it's a, it's a two-way street. Uh, your employees um, need to be treated right by your customers. Um, another risk uh, that uh, we, we have been educated about are certain cultural and language differences um, in the workplace. Um, and, and again, um, you can think of that in, uh, at times in, in uh, along the lines of this concept of isolation, right? So if, if someone doesn't, uh, is not comfortable speaking English, um, but they have an issue, do they feel comfortable enough to raise their hand um, uh, and, and to um, uh, communicate, right, in their own language? Or that's something that we, we tested. Um, um, and then, um, uh, what another issue that all employers are facing now, but but in particular, uh, Encore and Win is the economic factors that we're dealing with right now. Right, uh, we're in a terrible time. We all know that, um, uh, and and the the question that comes from that is not only can we survive this time, and the answer is yes, we will. But the question also is, are we able to to sustain some of these process fixes that we put in, into place? Uh, the HRCP and other things, um, despite the economic risk factors uh, that, 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 that went in our core. So, um, and happy, we're happy, of course, to answer any questions about that, but why don't we move to the next slide? Thank you, Preston. Um, so, this I, actually, I, um, this is Enrique Alejandra. Um, I was, I did have a question, maybe you'll speak to this uh, at a later time. I know, you know, the report goes into great detail, but throughout, the, you know, if you just stay in, in page six, you could be describing many other companies uh, having the same, the same risk factors. Uh, but more specifically, you could be des describing just any other um, hospitality or gaming company with similar, um, uh, risks. 
So I would be interested in, throughout the presentation, uh, an hour or a later time, to the extent that you could put into context what you've observed compared to other, uh, other companies, or if there's some kind of benchmark that uh, you could speak to. Um, I know it's all about making incremental progress, uh, and that they, they, it's, good, it's great to hear, by the way, that they're committed to their program and they're moving in, in, in a very positive direction, but I'd be interested in seeing how do you think uh, some of these risks and, uh, and program especially ranks or benchmarks against uh, others. Absolutely. We can address that right now at a high level, but we will certainly identify throughout the presentation how these risks manifest. When we look at this risk, you're absolutely right. They do apply to many different types of companies. Um, and in fact, our, as you see, their EEOC risk factors, they are born from generally the EEOC's understanding of what companies of all types face. Our approach was to understand from a longer list, which are most critical to win and to encore, but more than that, to drill down within the operations to see how these risks were manifesting. So it was less about the existence of the risk itself, which you know we almost took as a given was going to exist, but where exactly were the pressure points within the organization so that we could work with the company to ensure that the procedures that the compliance program bring to life the compliance program address these risks. So just to give one example that I think is familiar to the commission, um, the isolated workplaces, right? Typically when we think about isolated workplaces, we think about remote satellite operations that might be smaller and truly physically separated from corporate headquarters. That's not the case here, right? You have Two, two building, two, two properties that are pretty much self-contained. What we identify within the WIN and Encore operation, for example, are in-room dining attendants, right, who will walk the halls of the hotel property, who will have access to employee, sorry, to, to guest rooms, who are by definition at that moment isolated from the greater organization and more vulnerable to potential sexual harassment or worse, sexual assault by, uh, by a guest. Um, similarly, for example, um, employees who clean restrooms or who clean hallways or you know, have to go in smaller closets, again, more vulnerable in isolation for, for harassment um, type conduct. So that's how we apply the risks. Your question is absolutely on point though, and we will continue to highlight how that informed each of these, each of these elements. Does that help orient where, where we're going, Commissioner? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, but, but my point, I, uh, I know it's, it's well taken, which is uh, that isolation, for example, is not unique to win. Right. Uh, it's certainly uh, very clear to observe for every worker who does um, you know, in-room uh, delivery of meals and what have you. Uh, it's, it's true for everybody in the strip and many other gaming companies. So my, my question again is how do we contextualize, mm -hmm. you know, what they're experiencing compared to other companies? I would say what they're experiencing is not uncommon. Um, it's similar to what other companies are experiencing. I think with the gaming industry particularly, Wynn is a bit at the forefront of addressing these risks. They were not unknown to the board or to the leadership when we spoke to them. What we see is because they are so common, it becomes a question of, it, it is an industry risk, so what can Win do and what should Win do to address issues that are one, common, and two, right, just candidly, some that might be outside of their direct control. And we note in the report, as it starts to make this cultural shift, it is precisely because these are common risks, swimming upstream in some ways with respect to addressing risks that have I won't say tolerated, but have been accepted um, in the larger gaming industry um, context. And that is a unique challenge for a company like Wynn 
to be in almost, you know, a, a leadership position, I think, as it tries to address some of these more difficult uh, risks. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Thank you. And, and, and I think you'll just continue to follow up on Commissioner Zuniga's question as you go through, because it's obviously a, a broad one. So thank you. Absolutely, Will. Thank you for that. And it's actually a, a perfect segue to the culture and, and compliance hallmark, which, as we said in the opening remarks, really was a main focus because of the specific history that the company faced here with respect to um, the culture that trickle down uh, from the top, given the events that occurred um, with respect to the founder and, and other leaders who were there at the time. We have seen a meaningful shift and, you know, not to repeat what we said earlier, we want to focus here on how that shift has manifested itself. One thing that we look at is where is the company making investments, right? Is it only developing a paper policy program where it's saying and writing all the right things, but not to speak colloquially, right? Putting its money where its mouth is with respect to these issues. Um, one clear indicator for us is with respect to personnel staffing. Not only have there been significant leadership changes at the company with respect to personnel, but we've seen investment in critical positions. So meaningfully, for example, um, there has been a senior vice president of HR position created at corporate in Vegas who now owns the design and implementation of a human resources compliance program. That is critical. We'll speak a bit more to that um, when we speak about independence, but creating that position, giving her staff that is equipped and capable and experienced to help further the HR compliance program development is another um, indicator for us. And we have seen that. They're not just filling positions to fill them. The company seems to be very deliberate with the experience that it is seeking in its personnel uh, that own part of the human resources program implementation. We've seen program enhancements as well. Um, Preston will speak later to training, but we've seen significant investment in training on human resources issues, not just the regular annual trainings that you would expect to see at most companies, but also more focused training um, of managers and supervisors on some issues that are relevant to our review. And most importantly, we have seen increased transparency in the reporting of sexual harassment and discrimination cases. And we'll get into greater detail um, with that later, but the company is now elevating from both properties all allegations of sexual harassment, regardless of nature and size, to the general counsel at Win Las Vegas, and also to external counsel as warranted for review. And the same is done, that's done on a weekly basis, and the same is done on a quarterly basis with respect to discrimination claims. And all of that also goes to the Compliance Committee for review. We've seen those reports, they're, they're quite detailed. Um, as we note in the report, we, we have, you know, we're monitoring to ensure that that level of work, because it is a heavy lift for the teams on the ground, is sustainable. Um, which is an important objective of ours is to ensure that the company rolls out a program that can be sustained in the long term. Where we also should, get, should give credit, we have seen um, through interviews and through focus groups, um, the actual leadership of, of the company. So Matt Maddox, Marilyn Spiegel, Brian Gilbrandt are all recognized as being credible. This is something that we were very deliberate um, to test. They have gained credibility and respect from the org, from across, I'd say across the organization. Particularly, um, Ms. Spiegel and Mr. Gilbrandt are recognized by even inline employees as walking the floor, making themselves visible and have developed different platforms to communicate with, the comp with, the, with employees through shift briefings at the start of every shift, for example, um, email communication to make themselves visible. And that is a platform that we encourage in the report that the company can continue to leverage. Um, most of the communication that we're seeing right now focuses on customer service, on issues that are important to the operation to further 
to the shift we see to further embed that through the organization, as we said earlier, right? It has to trickle down. The company is well positioned to leverage those channels of communication so that employees hear directly from their leaders the importance of HR compliance, the company's position on sexual harassment and discrimination, and most critically, a speak out culture. We want the company to really promote its, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to this in, in the investigations um, section, to really promote its internal reporting channels and the fact that the company will address regardless of where the allegations come from and to whom they're directed, all um, sexual harassment and discrimination claims. As I was discussing um, with Commissioner Suniga, the larger industry does present a unique challenge. The company is aware of that. Um, I think until now it's, it's struggled with how to address those cultural challenges that, uh, that impact the entire industry, but we've seen an appetite to think creatively of what it can do to reset its communication on what is acceptable behavior, not just from its employees and its leaders, but also from those that visit its properties. Now, Alejandra, if I could just interject, this is Kathy. Um, on this slide, uh, <clears throat> what you're addressing are some of the uh, the, the movement that the company has shown to um, shift the culture. And yet it's also under the framework of these unique challenges of the casino industry. I think you'll probably be addressing it in your investigation section, but I just wondered if this is a good time to point out that, uh, or if you could elaborate on perhaps some of the um, uh, sort of, more state-of-the-art mo movement that they're making. I noted that they're developing plans to track and monitor data that they collect from their investigations to help inform their policies. I think that might be have been with respect to patron activity. Um, and then I also know they've, they've got the development of the, the new platform, which I'm sure you'll talk about in the channels. But I was just interested to know from an industry point of view, is that state-of-the-art? Is that data analysis something that is unique or is it expected? It's, uh, it, it's expected. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things that we'll talk about in investigations and in monitoring is more and more compliance expectations are trending to what are companies doing to test the effectiveness of their compliance programs. And that would include human resources compliance programs as well. So while it's commendable that the company is reviewing on a case-by-case -case basis all sexual harassment allegations and discrimination allegations. That's just one part of the story. And as we note in the report, that's, it, it's retroactive. It's demonstrating you know, what, what has happened um, in these individual cases where the company is moving um, consistent with industry expectations and the expectations of uh, enforcement agencies like the EEOC and the DOJ is that they take that data and analyze it in the aggregate. So for example, mm -hmm. on a quarterly basis, just to give a hypothetical, right? What are, what are the specific sexual harassment allegations that we have received? What is the nature of those allegations? Um, where, what departments do they come from, right? What positions are we seeing are most vulnerable? Because then that begins to tell a different narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you do with that data is then pressure tested against your program. What is the root cause? Is it that perhaps our policies are not clear? Is it that our training isn't clear? Is it a more systematic issue that we have to focus on? Um, so it, it, it arms the company with, as you would with other KPIs and operations, right? right, um, right, right. It's the exact same concept, just applying it to compliance. And what we will want to see Again, we've seen the company last quarter start to use that that um, that data, and to their credit, they've been doing this manually. Um, oh, oh. And the platform that you are alluding to, I think, is going to really one facilitate it and make the their ability to really work with that data more effective. Yeah. Um, so we will be as the monitorship continues 
looking at what the company, not just that they're aggregating it, but how are they actually putting it to use to create a feedback cycle on their policies, procedures, and implementation thereof, which is the most critical part. Right? Policies are important, procedures are important, but what we care about most is what you do with them. That's really helpful. Thank you. So the, the next um, Alejandra, can I ask a quick question now? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Cameron, no, this, thank you. Yeah, this is Gail Cameron. Um, I, I find this, uh, this portion of the presentation really interesting. You, as well as Preston, mentioned sustainable change. I do have some experience with monitoring in, in police departments. And, um, you know, I've always been interested in how well that change is sustained after the monitorship. And I, and I find it directly related to the leadership team. And lots of times when agencies are hiring new leaders, they ask a lot of questions about how well they performed in other positions, but maybe don't ask a lot of questions and their shared values of, of an HR uh, compliance uh, plan. Um, it, was, it was very good to hear that the leadership team is considered credible, but I'm just wondering if, um, if that will be part of um, the training or the company, the board realizes that the speed of the leader is so important and um, for this sustainable change to, to continue long after people stop asking the questions about this. And I was happy to hear you, you talk about it, but um, that's a piece I think a lot of organizations miss is that that initial, who are you bringing in? Who are the yes. folks that you are recruiting to your company? and Do they share these values? That's, I, I, I love that question um, for a couple of reasons. One, yes, leadership is critical and that's why we have focused on it. Um, but more than that, leadership does change, right? And whether it changes in five years or 10 years, it changes. And we have seen organizations who have put blood, sweat, and tears into creating a culture that starts to erode once the people who upheld that culture leave, which is why we put such an emphasis when we look at these programs on how are they embedded into the day-to-day -day operations of the organization so that it's not reliant on one, two, or you know, 10 people to keep it alive. So for example, we'll talk about risk assessments down the line. Um, how is the company actually leveraging other functions, its internal audit function, its security function, so that then it becomes an organic part of how the company operates. The systems that it's rolling out with respect to internal investigations, reporting, and its ability to synthesize and report that, that's, that if implemented correctly and, and housed in the correct place, should continue to live on past the tenure of the current leadership, which is the concern when you have something that's so manual um, and reliant on this leadership's interest and focus on these issues, the risk is that when there's a change that will, that will go by the wayside, harder to dismantle a program that is operating really on, on its own. Yeah, thank you. Of course, thank you. Commissioner Cameron, if I can add just one, one point that has become clear to us as well, um, was when you raised the police monitor tips, it's something that we're familiar with. Um, uh, and, and, and it is this, having spent time with leadership both at, um, in, in Boston and then of course in, in Las Vegas, I think it's pretty clear that um, the pain of 2018 is 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 still palpable right they, they still feel that and they have no desire to go through that again they get the message um so um not only are they um looking at and are we talking to them about the importance of making sure that they've got sustainable systems that that uh, go beyond just this leadership group but this leadership group gets it too and they, you know uh, they, they're in it as we understand it for the long haul um so that that i think is helpful Great to hear, thank you. And 
Commissioner Cameron, it's almost like you all are teeing up the next slides without knowing <laughs> where we're going. But, but the question that you raise is also why we look at how the company, where the ownership and authority over a compliance program sits. And, you know, as a hallmark, we call that proper authority, oversight, and independence. But what we're really talking about here is one who owns it, who has authority to make decisions with respect to not just the design and implementation of the compliance program, but to hold the, the company to account. If something actually does wrong, goes wrong, who's going to be the one who's going to raise their hand and say, you know, hey, time out, right? We have an obligation here, not just to protect the company's interests, but also to protect the life of, of our welfare and, and security of our employees. And so to that, we've looked at, and that person has to be a senior person within the organization, person or people, right? Have to have the experience um, in leading these types of programs and has to be equipped with the right team, experienced resources, and of course, the budget to be able to carry out these programs. Um, the company, as had occurred even before we started, has taken steps to ensure an independent or to design an independent oversight of its human resources program in a couple of important ways. One is the reconstitution of the compliance committee, which existed for, for a while, but in 2018 was reconstituted with truly independent members with no affiliation, formal affiliation to the company. They're not employees, they have no financial interest, um, which, is, which is important because at the end of the day, right, they should have no, no interest and should be able to, to ask tough questions as particularly given the fact that they do have visibility as we were alluding to earlier, to the company's um, sexual harassment and discrimination cases and how they are handled. Um, we have seen and we point in the, out in the report to certain factors that could, again, in the long term, jeopardize the ability of the compliance committee to exercise truly independent judgment. I wanna make clear we haven't seen that judgment compromised in the six months that we've been working um, on this project, but the, the gaming industry is a small community, right? And there's a balance that the company needs to strike as it thinks through its constitution of the compliance committee. And that is finding people who know the industry because that is critical, um, but at the same time have not too close personal relationships, professional relationships because of because of the industry being so small that could compromise, not for any wrong reason, right? But simply because I know you, I trust you, we've worked together for a really long time. I'm not gonna raise my hand in the same way as I would if I was just starting to work with you as a company or as a person. So those are things that again, in the long term, as a company thinks about what this committee should look like and who should be on there as a balance that will need to be struck. Um, we spoke about the enhanced HR organization, um, certainly very capable and professional and experienced people, particularly um, at the lead roles, both in Las Vegas at the corporate and property level and certainly in Boston. Um, at the property level as well. I've been very impressed with the leadership of the human resources um, department. In Boston, it's a new organization. They had a lot to do to launch an operation. Um, needless to say, the last couple of months have certainly not, not helped with the burden that an organization faces, but we will continue to, to work with the company to ensure that the team that it has in Boston isn't just staffed, that it's, that it's big enough Right, and that it has the depth of expertise that it needs to continue to, to implement and run this program. Another opportunity um, that we've identified, and this is something, you know, as Preston talked about, the company has been in crisis management mode. And what we've seen in our experience is when there's a crisis, you tend to build up very, very quickly. And that's a, a normal reaction once crisis subdues, it's important to make sure that 
the roles and responsibilities of the functions and the individuals that have oversight of the human resources compliance program are clear. So we have legal, we have the chief compliance officer, and we have HR, and of course the compliance committee. Each needs to understand where its authority starts and stops so that they're not in a position of feeling incapable or lacking authority because maybe somebody else has has a they perceive somebody else has that role and responsibility so that is something as we highlight in the report will require um, more analysis and assessment as as we as we move on um, Alejandro if I could jump in for a second this is Commissioner O'Brien I, I think this is sort of the general area in the detailed report where you talk about the resources particularly for EDH in terms of you know HR experience they're currently looking to backfill that you know, litigate that attorney position that was specialized in sort of the trainings and that sort of thing. I had a question specifically about, um, there's a comment on page 35 about the fact that the, the organization-wide compliance officer, um, because of his purported status with us, did not have the ability to provide as much assistance to Boston. Yeah. And I'm, my understanding is that's not entirely accurate. And I'm curious as to where that understanding came from. It came primarily through uh, interviews with different personnel across the company with, this, with respect to what the compliance officer's role is currently. And our understanding was because of, of those issues, right now he's not able to engage as closely and as critically with the Boston operation as, as they expect he will be. Okay. I I'm don't sure. believe that's entirely accurate but um commissioner o'brien i did have curious as you go forward whether you can drill down on that a little bit more absolutely. sort of as you go forward absolutely right if i could just add in on that commissioner o'brien um i did have a chance to speak with uh, loretta lilios too on that matter and um ieb did seek some additional uh, clarification from ebh um so uh alejandra if you could circle back to Loretta, we might want to make sure that that line on page 35 is ac accurately reflects our regulatory structure. Because as uh, Commissioner O'Brien also alluded, um, we're, we're not sure it's entirely accurate and you could just, um, um, if you find fit, amend your report accordingly. Absolutely. Um, Thanks. And we we appreciate that. And that is something that has been critical to us is to make sure that assumptions and facts are accurate. So we appreciate you um, pointing that out to us and we'll certainly follow up. Yeah, and sure it's not accurately it's, reflected. Yeah, it's not an uncomplicated um, you know, distinction. So it would just be helpful to go back to, I think Loretta will expect that, um, that call. Fantastic. But I do we think it do also that. requires following up with the company in terms of their understanding and representations in that regard. Absolutely. Yeah. Understood, Commissioner. Thank you. We'll do that. Thank you. That takes us to policies and procedures. Preston? Yes. You can be hit uh, on mute. Um, so, so, <laughs> we can, so we can hear you. Area, uh, where we can uh, um, save some time because of uh, the fact that this has been a focus in the past and I have a focus before uh, we got involved. Um, but to, to kind of lead off our team in this discussion, obviously all of us are on board that policies and procedures are the start to having a, a, a good program. They're the start to it, right? Um, before we came on, the company updated sexual harassment and discrimination policies and, and, and uh, some related policies as well. Uh, we identified uh, some opportunities for the company to enhance its existing policies and to strengthen uh, its policy environment um, by adding more details where, uh, where necessary um, and addressing some of the areas that are, are, are critical to HR compliance. Um, as you've seen in our report, we pointed to, for example, uh, the importance of a standalone um, uh, religious uh, discrimination and harassment policy, uh, disability, uh, pregnancy accommodations and, and, and harassment, um, 
and, and even anti-discrimination and, and uh, with respect to pregnancy as well. Um, although some of those areas may be a subset of the areas that are enumerated in Title VII, the fact is that they're important enough to have their own rules, right? And to make sure that the organization uh, uh, and, and employees understand what those rules are with respect to those areas. Um, it's, it's, you know, of course, it's not just enough to have the right policies, of course, um, but your employees and people in your workplace have to know what these policies are, right, and abide by them. Um, and um, we, we found opportunities uh, that we are in discussion with the company about uh, to um, improve um, uh, the uh, recognition of, of policy. Their, their employees, for example, that we encountered through focus groups um, who uh, didn't have access to the wire. Now, why does that matter? It matters because uh, the wire is a place where policies are kept. Right? So let's say you had some question, you're an employee, and you had some question as to what the policy pertains to. You, you, you were trained, but you just have a follow-up question. If you're not able to get on the wire, uh, that presents a difficulty. Um, we will continue to monitor uh, this issue um, and, and related issues as we go forward. Thank you. Um, yes, and I, part of the implementation too, when we spoke earlier about the company um, communication platform, one of the things that we're also encouraging is to ensure that it's not just rolling out, but when it's implementing human resources policies or changes to human resources policies, that it really promote um, and ensure that even if employees read the policy on the wire, that they really understand it. Um, and that does two things, right? It's ensuring one proper compliance with the company's uh, policies and expectations and two it's again communicating that tone and that culture that the company is is looking to to enforce and going back to commissioner Suniga's question right this is one of the areas where we look at specific risk factors to make sure that they are at a baseline addressed in policies. Um, that's not the, you know, as we've said, not, not where it stops, um, but it's an important indicator that the company has internalized the risk, um, acknowledged the risk, and is communicating to its, uh, to its employees what, it, what has to be done to, to, to that risk. And that is something that would be standard across companies, across industries, and very much an expectation of uh, both the EEOC and the Department of Justice based on their compliance uh, program guidance. If, if I can, um, on that, um, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, I'm thinking about your question. Um, and, and there's one component of it that jumps out. I, I believe this may have been it uh, implied. The question is, is the company learning from its peers in the industry, right? Um, uh, and, and to what extent is it taking on best practices um, that it's seen, quote, unquote, best practices, which is obviously a, a phrase that we have to be careful about. But, um, um, from the industry and with respect to policies, but I think this uh, goes uh, really across the board. It is, it is encouraging to us to see that um, in Las Vegas, their, their chief of, of human resources is someone who came from a mature HR environment, mm -hmm. right? An organization that had a mature HR environment. And, and, and had maybe more bells and whistles um, in its program than, uh, than Wynn did before 2018. So I, I think that, that that continues to to help this process, again, with policies and other things. Go into some third party relationships. Yep, um, third party. So when, at the start of the monitorship, based on the commission uh, commission's decision and order, we were focusing primarily on the changes and the elements of the program that the company had implemented with respect to vendors, service providers, and its management of, the, of its external counsel. As we moved through the first six months of the monitorship, particularly with and, and takeaways from focus groups, one of the key risk areas, and we highlight as the highest risk factor with respect to third parties, are patrons. And 
both the EEOC and the DOJ highlight third parties as a key risk for all organizations. Um, how those risks manifest itself vary, um, and certainly in this context was, was very particular. What we've heard from employees is that sexual harassment and discrimination with respect to employee by employees is really they don't perceive as a as a high risk but they do and they raised offending behavior by by patrons as something that is that is quite prevalent not terribly surprising um but there was again given the the larger the larger casino industry culture to be clear um what was interesting for us was the perception of employees that the companies, and Preston alluded to this when we were speaking about the risks, the company's particular focus on client service. And this is something, um, Commissioner Zuniga, that, that emerged as a, as a differentiator in the risk profile uh, for us. But when an on-course focus on customer service is something that they take very seriously, and it is a, something that employees themselves take great pride in. We heard routinely how proud employees are to work at Win and of the Win brand and to, and, and to promote that brand. An unintended consequence of that has been employees perceive that they are not empowered in some instances, to back on patron behavior that is offending. Because it's, it could be perceived as inconsistent with how the company expects its employees to interact with and treat employees and the type of, um, of experience that, that, that they want their patrons to have with respect to the service they receive from, from the staff. So where you might want to push back or perhaps you know speak to a patron in a way to signal that they should stop what they're doing um, is something that employees have felt they need to feel more empowerment to do to be clear employees have said the company there is a line of course they understand that there is no touching is never accepted um, you know any any physical contact is not accepted but there is a gray area of offending behavior that the company should make clear will not be tolerated and more importantly empower its employees to uh, respond to that behavior in a way that is that is appropriate to ensure that it doesn't continue the company has in place policies that addresses interactions with patrons um, it doesn't quite go to the heart of this issue, though, um, particularly in internalizing the perception that employees have. Again, it's a matter of training. It's a matter of intentional communication on these issues. And this, of course, starts to get into that area of what the company can control and it can't control. You can't control your third parties and patrons in the same way that you can control your employees. But you can set expectations. Um, and we've made recommendations in the report of ways that the company can start doing that with respect to what it expects from its patrons and its guests. We see that in other industries. You walk into an establishment and they tell you if you behave a certain way, the company has the right to kick you off the property. The company already has that in place. It has trespassing procedures for patrons who commit any type of offending um, behavior or, or violations of law to ensure that that trespassing procedure is uniformly applied um, across patrons, whether they be smaller value players or high value players, is important to start shedding this perception from its employees that the company tolerates certain gray area of behavior, particularly if this is a high roller or someone who is considered to be a VIP patron. Questions? Yes. Um, yeah, I just I have a comment more than a question, but you can obviously expand on it if you want, Alejandra. This seems to me to be an area um, in the area that Enrique talked about where Wynn really is standing alone in how they need to deal with this in terms of because so much of their brand and is the five star service, there is a heightened tension, I think, in this area that doesn't necessarily apply in other um, competitors' arenas. So um, 
it's a comment. I don't know whether you want to comment it or not, but it does seem to be an area that's a little trickier for them to tread than maybe some other casinos. It is. And that came across also from the employees that we spoke to, particularly those. And this is true for Boston and Las Vegas. Um, I should make that point clear. And it is one of those themes that we heard in almost every focus group. Um, employees who have worked at other casinos were very clear that they have faced offending behavior from patrons in their entire career, but have been able to challenge and push back that behavior more directly and in some ways more effectively than they feel they can do it when. And we got some very specific examples from employees who have faced that circumstance. So yes, you're absolutely right. And Commissioner Suniga, this is one of those risks um, that is quite different um, for when because of it, right? Because of, of, of the brand. We will um, note that, and this is certainly for, for the company to think through, right? But at the same time, it does create an opportunity as part of reinforcing that brand and preserving the patina that comes with that brand to leverage that and to say, you know, we, we will offer a five-star experience that is free from this type of offending conduct, not just for the benefit of our employees, but also for the benefit of, of our patrons. Alejandra, I like that you mentioned that in the report that you said flourish behavior from one patron could actually um, impact the, the experience for another highly valued patron. I thought that was really important. Can you, um, just for uh, a reminder, give a, a few of the examples that you offered to the company to be able to address that tension that Commissioner O'Brien um, mentions? It's a, it's a real tension, and I think um, Enrique's initial question really um, highlights the this issue. So uh, you did have some concrete suggestions in your report. We did. Um, we had, and Ann and Preston can help me remi remind you of the concrete examples too, but we had, for example, um, where employ where guests to the hotel are checking in, there could be language in the contract that you're signing that says this is the type of behavior that is visible, right? Um, this is the type of behavior that we expect. So almost like a like a code for, for patrons, a standards of behavior code that can be printed on the, when you go into cash, cash in your chips, for example, there could be a sign that says these are the standards of behavior and if you violate them, we reserve the right to, to exit you, to trespass you from the premises. Um, any paper that is received by patrons or by guests can have that same language. On the website, you very often see vendor and supplier codes of conduct. We could have, you could have patron standards of behavior that is quite visible, again, to try to promote that culture um, within, its, within its buildings. You know, one thing I might add here, um, Alondra before said, uh, use the term up, upstream, right? So, so because these efforts may be in some ways um, are, are going upstream, both for, for when, but the industry as a whole. Um, uh, the, the company has to be very purposeful about communicating these standards that, that Alejandro pointed to. Uh, they, it, they, you know, and, and that, that is where it becomes difficult uh, because uh, the company doesn't want that to dominate the, the, the patron experience. Um, but yet needs patrons to remember it. Um, um, and, um, you, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is that um, when that happens and, and, and patrons are on board, not only is that a better, is, is it a better place uh, for employees, but it's a better place for other patrons and a better place for when, because there may be patrons who are not coming now because they're a, a little, little um, iffy about uh, what the environment has been. But once they know that the environment is one where they can feel um, more secure and safer, um, and where harassment is not gonna be tolerated, uh, uh, there's a there's a win-win-win, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Alejandro, this is um, Commissioner Stebbins. I want to talk about the, the vendors, vendors and service providers. Yes. And passing some of those obligations through contractual provisions. Um, I couldn't get a sense of whether that's something they, they're doing now or is that a recommendation? And have you seen it else, elsewhere? And that's why you're making it a recommendation. Um, thank you for that question. So I will clarify the company is doing that already it is we've seen standard agreements that include the company's expectations on sexual harassment and discrimination and more importantly requiring that vendors and suppliers report um, if they have knowledge of any sexual harassment or discrimination what we have and this is perhaps where the confusion come in, came in what we have not done is actually tested the implementation of that so while we've seen the template agreements what we intend to do in the next phase is actually look at actual contracts with vendors and suppliers to make sure that those clauses aren't being negotiated out, which we do see happen in other in other companies and industries, right? Sometimes clauses come out. Um, and that it is the company's, if the company's template agreement is not being used, that they are incorporated to the extent they don't already exist in the supplier or vendors agreement. So that that's that's the testing that will that we will want to do going forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so th those are the changes that we've seen with respect to that category of third parties. With external counsel, the MGC's um, decision in order, of course, focused on deconfliction policies, which is to ensure that counsel, external counsel that are representing the company are doing so in a way that is not informed by any or tainted by any conflict of interest, the company has rolled out a policy to that effect. Um, in our review of it, the policy does not co quite go far enough. It of course passes down to an uh, external counsel the obligation that we all have of ensuring that we are avoiding conflicts of interest with respect to our clients, but it does not directly address the possibility of external counsel also being called upon by company personnel for individual representation, as was reflected in the MDC, M MGC decision and order, as having occurred in the past. It's important that the company internalize that and reflect that in its, in its internal policies and also guidance that it provides to external counsel. We did review uh, billing guidelines that it extends to external counsel to inform, um, to highlight that potential risk. But more importantly, and this also touches on the controls environment, that it have in place a concrete and formalized review and approval procedure of all third of all external counsel engagements. That's an important control to make sure that the company knows what its external counsel are doing and for whom. And we, we do understand that as a matter of practice, the general counsel does review and approve all engagements. But again, looking at that sustainability element, it, it's important to make sure that that is part of the company's control environment, as would be the case for any other contract related to operational transactions. Questions for Alejandra on external counsel? Um, I, I do in terms of, um, there seemed to be a theme in terms of conflict of interest that was in not only external counsel, but also in definitions in terms of personal relationships and that sort of thing. It's mentioned a couple times in terms of, um, and it's an area of concern I have going forward that in terms of why we're here in the first place, which is the idea of undue influence or favoritism or conflict of interest, not only in external counsel, but also in the personal relationships. And so I would assume that that is something given the baseline that would be a focus going forward in terms of how they expand knowledge and um, dissemination of the information in the organization on that. It will 100% be a focus as we go forward. And you're right to have identified that as an opportunity in both, one is a theme throughout the report, but yes, in both categories, um, internal conflict of interest policy and externally. This is um, Commissioner Judd Stein. I have two uh, questions on this. One, um, <clears throat> with respect to the policy on, um, on conflicts, I understand that the general counsel is, is the point person 
I suspect that might have been the case in the past that led um, you know, to many concerns for us in our underlying decision. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure what the solution is, but if I were the general counsel um, of this uh, company, I would want to make sure that I'm um, not solely responsible for keeping records of these conflicts. And I'm not sure how that gets, um, you know, the, where there are other, um, who, who comes in to assist on that. But um, a single point person to keep track not just literally being able to keep track of these, but also because, as you point out, particularly in Nevada and I suspect in Boston, the gaming legal community is a small one. And so uh, we want to make sure that no single person is, is keeping sort of the record and score of these um, external council relationships. Um, you, you, you raise... If I can just comment on that briefly, um, you, you raise an important point that we as compliance um, monitors always look to, and it's the formalization of authority. Right. And one of the things that we do, I think we, we allude to in the report, um, but do intend as we continue to look at the company's controls environment, is where there are, there's a need for dual approval. Mm -hmm. One area that we highlight, for example, that we have not um, tested is payment of external counsel invoices to avoid some of the issues that you raised in the in, in your decision and order that would be an opportunity for there to be a dual approval right typically what yes. we would recommend is general counsel and cfo okay. um, and yeah. so part of the ongoing testing of the company's controls environment will be what we would in other terms call compliance sensitive transactions right in in more in in other areas of the law but similarly looking at where there are decisions, review procedures that would require that second look. Because again, right, we don't want there, you know, it's, it's interesting, the company, it, it's very, it's, it, there's not a lot of bureaucracy and that's a good thing in many ways, but it creates vulnerabilities too with respect to oversight and authority and striking that balance without dramatically changing the company culture but ensuring that it has documented controls with respect to these areas is going to be a strong focus in the next in the next phase thank you that's really helpful i, I was struggling for uh, the the term but it is really a sharing of that dual responsibility and, and it would make sense I, I, from my perspective that it's shared with the CFO, but I would defer to the ex your expertise and the expertise of Wynn. Um, and, and in terms of what, uh, to build on what Commissioner O'Brien just commented on, the, the themes that were emerging in terms of conflicts, um, not only the legal, but just uh, conflicts throughout um, the organization and the um, personal relationships that you've noted have not been terribly carefully defined. I would just say, and I think you've highlighted it, that we want to remember that that what makes this more difficult would be the imbalances of power that are also associated with those definitions. So uh, that was, of course, very important to us in our decision. And, and we know that moving forward, that will be um, certainly part of just making sure policies and procedures reflect that, that theme. And the training, I, you know, we one of the things that we bring up in, in the report as well is the importance consent and you highlight this in, in the decision in order as well consent is a complicated, very complicated issue, as we're all well, well aware. Um, and so to have that ongoing training and communication and sensitizing all levels of the company, but particularly those that are in the positions of power, to what is and isn't consent um, to the extent that it can never be put in a box, but at least to recognize where there are questions or issues and that that can be properly escalated um, will be an opportunity that is an opportunity that we identified that we'll be looking to um, guide the company to fill in the next phases. Thank you. That takes us, so uh, slide 11, training and guidance, and that is back to Preston.
And, and Alejandro, you mentioned training. I think you've teed this up well. Um, in, <laughs> in, in, uh, training and guidance. This is an area where, again, we, we've had, I think there was work done before we got, obviously we were on board. Um, and it's one where we may be able to save some time today, but of course we want to answer your questions um, broadly. Uh, training is um, an essential component of uh, any anti-harassment effort. Uh, same with this, with discrimination, uh, but to be effective, uh, the training has to be part of a holistic effort undertaken by the employer, and that's something that the EEOC tells us in the 2016 report. Um, the company has uh, devoted considerable resources to its training program. We've seen that. We've had the uh, uh, opportunity to see uh, uh, their training conducted on a couple of occasions. Um, and uh, it, it's clear that the company has, has um, kind of done a, a real, real double back on its training to make sure that um, the messages that they want to communicate to the em employees are being cute, right? clearly communicated to employees and managers. Um, it covers obviously anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, um, and uh, certain diversity and inclusion uh, topics too. Um, the, the, we talked about focus groups at the beginning of this presentation uh, and throughout. We'll talk about them again. Focus groups conducted uh, it, that we conducted uh, during this assessment suggested that training has been well received, uh, but that additional training was, is required, um, and particularly function specific training for, for certain roles and, and, uh, and functions with responsibility for implementing or enforcing. Uh, important aspects of the HR compliance uh, program. One of the things you see that we talk about is additional training, for example, for, for the board um, and, and other stakeholders. Um, by way of recommendations, um, one of the keys, one of the reasons why the, the, the training that we witnessed worked is because they had uh, an, an attorney on staff who was uh, responsible for conducting it and did um, a, a thorough um, uh, job with it. And, and that position needs to be um, um, filled now because that an attorney is no longer with the organization. Um, the, um, um, as you said, um, you know, we talked a little bit about personal relationships um, in this, in the past segment. Uh, we think that the board uh, should receive training on, on personal relationships. Um, I, we also suggest that the compliance committee, again, is one of these groups that has responsibility for uh, the HRCP, um, uh, that the compliance committee needs to be trained on anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, uh, and the company's investigation protocols, particularly as those protocols um, begin to uh, evolve, which we'll talk a little bit about in the investigation part of this. Um, um, in the industry generally, um, uh, training is, has, has gone from uh, focusing on specific uh, areas of discrimination to just um, um, appropriate conduct, right? And, and, and so I think the, um, the, the past trainer that the company used had an eye on, on evolving the training, right? As it, as it becomes more, uh, as, as, the, as the EEOC and other agencies uh, uh, focus on evolution of the training, so that needs to continue to happen. Um, another thing that we talk about in the report is the importance of using the company's um, existing communications channels, such as pre-shifts, to conduct briefings on a regular basis to reinforce messages from trainings. Um, we've seen that with other employers. Um, it, it, it works. And the reason why we say it works is because um, that's often what employees remember the, the, the most. It's one thing to sit down one time and hear a trainer. But if you hear it from your manager on a regular basis on pre-shifts, it takes on another, a, a new life to it and becomes more part of the culture. Um, um, and then lastly, uh, to ensure that the company's uh, training is effectively uh, communicated and, and conveys its policies, uh, uh, the company should identify methods to uh, continue to uh, test its training program. Um, uh, for example, uh, if you train employees on issues A, B, and C, at the end of that module, uh, 
Are you having your employees answer questions about what they've learned? Um, so that, that that's another way to really ingrain right what you test or what you what you train them on. So um, that's training and guidance. Happy to answer any questions or to, uh, Alejandro or Anne may want to add uh, to it as well. I think what, one thing that um, is worth highlighting is when we you know all companies will tell you training is mandatory. Um, that is a good thing. One thing that we look to though is what the company actually does to ensure that everyone is being held to that standard. We tested that um, at WIN in a variety of ways and the company should be commended. It really does do a very good job um, of ensuring that all of its employees top down are mandatory. Um, you know, we heard both in, in Boston and in Vegas, employees will not be allowed to clock in if they have lapsed in the training that they are supposed to be taking. Um, in Vegas, it's now managers and supervisors who are actually scheduling employees to training, so it's not left up to employees to, uh, to register themselves for training. So those are steps that are reasonable, um, and as far as you know, we can see, have been effective. It was when in focus groups, employees were most emphatic when we asked about training and we said, is it mandatory? They said, oh yes, they're clear. They understood that training could not be missed. Um, which is which is helpful. So all the more reason to Preston's points of ensuring that it speaks to not just the policies and procedures, but really gives one concrete examples to help employees understand these HR issues and, and how they play into their enforcement and implementation. This is Gail Cameron. I had one one comment question uh, with regard to training. Um, I know that I read uh, something about you know IT uh, systems and being able to track better um, what is happening and you know making sure that you're it's a way of mitigating risk, right? Tracking properly. Um, is there any? And I didn't see this for those individuals who, who may need additional training. Do you think you can? keep them as employees, but they they may have had an issue with one or two of these, um, you know, something that they've done that they would require additional training. Is, is there something in place for that kind of uh, additional training if needed? We've not seen that formally. Um, we have not seen that happening. Um, it is something that we recommend they will so they're, they're we have seen instances where people are trained supplementally but we haven't seen a formal process to identify where additional training is actually needed and you know one of the things that we've seen companies roll out is you you roll out a policy you particularly for um roles that are responsible for enforcing that policy and you actually do a little bit of a quiz, right, to ensure that that is internalized. And something we did um, at the company where, where I worked was if you didn't score a certain percentage, you had to retake those modules to make sure that they are truly internalized. Now, do you need to do that for every employee? No, but you should identify any employee that has an enforcement or oversight role so that again you're making sure your managers and supervisors absolutely understand what their obligations are um, that is that is an opportunity that we do identify when we talk about testing the effectiveness of the program and enhancing the effectiveness of the training program is what we would be looking to thanks one of, of the course. one of the things is very briefly on it uh, that the company we understand the company does now um, is uh, in, in some investigations and, and uh, trying, trying to get to a, a, a real uh, conclusion, uh, they've identified some opportunities for employees uh, to, be, to be trained. Um, but um, making that more formal uh, along the lines of what Alejandra is uh, describing is, is, is something that would be important, right? Uh, because yeah. It's one thing to put it in the file, but then are you tracking it, right? Are you making sure it happened, right? Um, are you then making sure that the employee understands the point on which they've been trained so that they're not back in the same 
uh, position, you know, a month or two from now, having done the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I guess to, to tee up, oh, it, it, does that answer the question, Commissioner Cameron? It does. Thank you. Okay. To tee up um, investigations next, that, that is, oh, no, I'm sorry, we're going to incentives, investigations next, so slide 12. Um, one of the areas where we've recommended additional training is on investigations to ensure that human resources and other functions that are involved um, in investigations are trained to do that to the company's standards. Um, the other thing I'll add, and then I'll press it, uh, I'll pass it on to Preston, is in the investigations protocol that we reviewed, there is a requirement that where there is an allegation that perhaps has not been corroborated that the person against whom the allegation was made is followed up with and also the complainant is followed up with and one of the opportunities there is to ensure that part of the discipline process is to speak to the person who was alleged to have uh, engaged in offending behavior as a reminder, almost as a doubling down on what the company's expectations are, so that if the allegation had proven to be true, it's clear to the um, target of the complaint that it would not be tolerated and would result in, in heightened discipline. So Preston, internal reporting and investigations? Yes, yeah, so, so and, and we'll talk, as you said, we'll talk a little bit about the, the um, training that we suggested for investigators. Um, but ste stepping back for a moment, um, uh, and again, thinking about context, we talked about context at the beginning and, and risk factors. Uh, we understood very clearly coming into this that uh, investigations, as it has been in the case in other, you know, employment monitorships that the EOC has seen, uh, investigations were a, a real concern that you voiced to the company. Uh, and we also understood from the company that it, um, it it knew that it needed to improve its process. Um, you know, for example, you simply cannot have uh, in any workplace senior executives who are accused of violating the most important rules in the company's code of conduct, and yet they're not investigated. All right, you can't have, you cannot have a groundswell of reports about harassment and have a company, um, any company, sit on it on its hands uh, if they're taking its rules seriously. Uh, the company has shown that it does understand this. This is from our discussions with uh, 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 various folks in, in the legal department and others, um, and in fact, the very top in, in the board. Um, it is extremely important that the company continues to make sure that employees know how they can raise compliance concerns. Um, and and uh, these channels need to be um, um, socialized and need to be a part of the, 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 the culture. Um, um, uh, and, and you don't want there to be roadblocks to employees who uh, feel that they want to raise a concern because the fact of the matter is any employee who steps forward typically is, is going to do so gingerly. Right? If you have a roadblock to that employee then you know, stepping forward and making a complaint, um, that complaint may not be made. And that, that's a lost opportunity. Um, amongst other um, suggestions, we recommend that the company make sure employees who speak English as a second language know that the reporting channels are multilingual. And that's something that we understand the company is going to focus on and, and include in this next generation of its reporting tool. Uh, it's also important that the company ensures reporting channels are, uh, are fully accessible to employees. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the if, if you tell me uh, uh, as an employee that I can go to a certain place within the company to make a complaint, but yet because of the hours that I work, that place is not open, that's a, that's a, that's a barrier, right? And again, the complaint may not be made, it can be a lost opportunity. Um, once complaints are made, the company needs to make sure that the team that investigates those complaints is fully trained and, and effective. And this is what goes to what Alejandro said about the training. You see that, you know, as a, as a centerpiece of this section, we've suggested uh, uh, factors that the company um, should focus on in training uh, its, its investigators. And we understand that uh, that, that training has, has already started, which uh, was good to hear and we'll continue to focus on that. Um, um, 
in conducting investigations, we want the company to focus on on several important aspects of the process, right? So including uh, improving timeliness, ensuring investigators are, are, are themselves well qualified. Do they know how to follow up on a question, for example, right? And that's, that, that's easier said than done. Uh, do the investigators um, understand the importance, and this is central to any workplace investigation, do they understand the importance of making a credibility determination? We talked about this, I think, uh, maybe um, a little less than a year ago when we first met you, but the, the he say, she say um, problem in workplace investigations um, cannot be where the investigation stops uh, if, 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 if the company can at all help it. Right, simply saying, well, this person said the, the, the accused says this, but the accuser says this, and there's no one to break the tie, so we're going to throw our hands up. That is something that that an employers uh, who have a sophisticated workplace investigation program um, know that they've got to they've got to do a little bit more than that. And credibility determinations is one of the ways that they do that, um, and understanding how to make credibility determinations. Um, um, using formalized even criteria for it um, within the training so that um, um, and practicing it, for example, in, in training sessions for investigators is uh, something that we've seen used in other in other settings. Um, so with that, I, I, are there any questions uh, with respect to, to investigations or comments from Anne or Alejandro? Yeah, so I, I think uh, um, just to, to highlight, the company does have in place internal reporting channels that are known and accessible to employees. We have seen through focus groups in our own, re our own review an opportunity for the company to make clear, as we started to say earlier, that its expectation is that employees will use these channels. We've seen evidence that they are being used. We've seen a number of allegations of all types in Vegas and in Boston. What we hear from employees though still is some confusion as to the anonymity of reporting or where and how they can make anonymous reports. So critically important for the company to encourage deliberately a speak out culture so that those reporting channels are known, not just known, but also understood. Um, we spent time talking to employees and focus groups who raised meaningful questions um, as to whether or not an anonymity was, was real. Um, and in some instances, particularly in Boston, a bit of confusion as to which the reporting lines were that they should be using. So one of the things that we like to see companies do, and this is standard across companies and industries, is signage, right, that says, that promotes the obligation to speak up. Um, signage in common areas that employees can see every single day of where the website is, of what the phone number is, of where they go to make these, these um, allegations, is an opportunity that we see particularly with respect to Boston. On the investigation side, the elements that Preston um, walked through are, are critical to an investigation's protocol. The company has a protocol in place um, that speaks to some of those elements, um, but does need to, one, build it up, um, and two, focus in on the training and the expectations that it has with respect to how these investigations are going to be carried out. We have, um, Investigating sexual harassment discriminations allegations are very difficult. Um, and what we perceived from interviews was a necess the need for further clarification on how those, as Preston referred to them, he said, she said, situations must be addressed where there isn't corroborating evidence that what is alleged actually happened the company should train its, its HR function and its management and supervisors to understand what steps it can take short of termination. If you are reintegr reintegrating someone because you haven't corroborated the allegation, what are the safety nets that you can put in place for the manager, the supervisor, the person who complained to ensure that 
every party understands what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and that if there is a recurrence, there will be heightened escalation of discipline. So those are, again, when we talked about areas in the program that were in need of additional maturity, this is one of those areas that we view as one most critical to the success of the HR compliance program, but also an area that um, can benefit from, from additional formalization, if you will. Any, any questions with respect to this area? Uh, you, you know, yes, I, uh, Alejandra, I, um, um, and maybe you already touched on it, uh, the notion of difficulty, but I can imagine scenarios in which having a very robust protocol itself may, in, in terms of investigation, even calling it an investigation, uh, might have the unintended consequence of putting somebody, um, you know, in, in, in a position of being the offender, um, of defensiveness, of saying, you know, you just you should have just come back and, and, and talk to me, um, or, or whatnot. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about um, the dilemma that arises from how important it is to nip something in the bud by getting, you know, all right, somebody got uncomfortable, let's speak to the other person. Maybe it doesn't rise to the level of harassment, uh, yet but we don't want to keep this going and then make sure you know end up finding out that it really turns out to be harassment but by doing so early formally and so on um, you can have somebody be you know offended turned off and and hopefully not retaliate uh, later uh, at somebody for having been um, you know raised their, their their hand to say you know i think this is unacceptable Absolutely. That is, it, it, you know, I'd say a vast majority of the allegations that you see would probably fall in that category, right? And you do, you have to be very careful as you communicate to two parties, because as you explain, or as your question notes, overcorrection can have, can have one consequence, right, of saying, I raise my hand because it's going to overcorrect and I don't want to make a big deal of this undercorrecting can lead to someone who's engaging in that gray area fully understand where the line is so critically and, and the investigation protocol that we've seen contemplates that type of follow-up but greater guidance is important for the investigation teams to understand what type of communication there's a feeling let me back up there's a feeling that in order to protect confidentiality and anonymity you can't share any information with anyone about anything right and that leads to particularly when an investigation doesn't result in an obvious disciplinary action for people to think that the company didn't handle it correctly yep. so there's that education process that needs to occur of you know you can talk to the complainant about what you've done to investigate his or her complaint right you can talk to the person who was accused of the misconduct about why this particular action doesn't necessarily rise to heightened discipline like termination, but why it continues to be a problem, right? If, if it continues, why, why, it would, why it would be a problem. That level of sensitivity we have not seen yet manifested in the investigations that we have, that we have reviewed but would go a very long way, not just to reinforcing the company's own protocols, but going back to this theme of culture, of really educating on a case-by-case -case basis what the company's expectations are and ensuring, as the protocol requires, that you check in. You check in with the person who raised the allegation and say, look, you know, we talked two months ago, we determined that the incident that you reported wasn't a terminable offense, but how are things now, right? And retaliation is something that the company does um, inform its employees about, but stronger messaging there, I think would also be very, um, would be an opportunity for the company to continue. Does that answer your question, Commissioner? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Alejandro, just to follow up, you did mention, uh, this is Kathy, uh, that you, um, it, there have been several, I'm not sure if you, you know, multiple 
mm -hmm. uh, reports made on se sexual harassment and that there, the channels, while maybe the anonymous channel isn't clear to all the employees, that channels are working because you are receiving reports. I think we'd be remiss not to ask you um, about whether the multitude of reports seems um, consistent with the uh, industry norms, that they're, they're not um, out of line for risk uh, with respect to the, the um, entity. That's a great question. They are not out of line. Um, and I would say in two categories. One, they're not out of line in the numbers that we've seen. And they're not out of line in the nature of the allegations um, that we've seen. So it's consistent with what we would expect to see in this type of company, um, in this type of industry. I would be remiss to note that we have, not, not to note, that we have seen also allegations made against management and more senior people within the organization and have looked at investigation files and confirmed that the company does investigate fully uh, claims made against even senior managers within organization and we have seen appropriate disciplinary action be taken in those situations which of course will continue to be a critical focus given the, uh, the historical events with respect to the number of, of complaints, you know, one of the um, uh, one of the things that you see as you study this issue is is that training, right? So more effective training leads to more complaints, leads to a healthier system. So um, you know, we've definitely seen uh, the, the the number of complaints, um, and as Alan Honda said, they don't seem to be out of line, uh, but um, um, it in the number of complaints in and of itself is 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 not always a a, a bad thing. It's something we'll keep in mind as we go forward. Do we want to go into incentives and discipline? Any other questions on investigations? If um, if not, we can. And of course, we still have time. It, it, we still have Q and A at the end if if time permits. Absolutely. Thank you. Go ahead, Preston. This may be an area where we can, again, save a little bit of time, but, but uh, we open it up to, to uh, all of you. Um, again, just by way of context, um, uh, the, uh, the measures that the company takes to discipline employees who violate uh, uh, the company's business and, and personal codes of conduct and HR policies and procedures are, are critical. Right, um, we see that they do have these measures in place, which is important, um, and we'll continue to focus on the on the use of these measures uh, when they are, are when they become necessary. Um, the um, uh, we we've suggested that um, the company um, uh, su um, incorporate more formal guidance. Um, uh, with respect to um, uh, discipline, uh, so that um, there's a, a, a broader understanding of, um, of, of essentially what uh, misconduct leads to what level of discipline, right? Um, and, and there's a lot of different factors that go into it. If you formalize some of those factors, uh, then your employees and your managers can have a, a, a better understanding of consequences and it makes the, the system better. Um, it, it creates a consistency, right, um, in the uh, discipline that's being given and a, a uniformity in it as well. Um, uh, one of the challenges that the company faces it, uh, is the lack of uh, formal performance management uh, procedures, uh, which, as all of us understand, can be uh, powerful tools to drive desired behaviors. Um, senior leadership has also noted the need and has been developing formal goal setting and evaluation um, process, which it plans implement, um, we understand first at the top of the organization. Uh, uh, again, making sure that everyone understands what the playing field is and what are, uh, how they're being measured and um, what conduct is, is, is uh, appropriate and what misconduct is going to lead to to, to certain levels of discipline. Um, 
the key again in, in, in this area, um, as we've seen here and in, in so many other places, is consistency um, um, and, and understanding of consequences. Uh, with respect to incentives, uh, we have seen the company do a good job here. Um, um, uh, and we, we recommend that the company continue focusing on incentives, right? So, you know, it's not discipline and incentives is not um, just a focus on discipline. It's also on incentives, right? Incentives to make sure that employees are doing the right thing or improving the culture as they go along. Um, um, and, and so we've seen them use incentives that have uh, uh, been helpful, particularly in Las Vegas, right? Recognition of employees who are doing uh, the right thing. Um, um, we we uh, have also recommended that uh, the company upgrade its uh, progressive discipline and performance policy uh, to provide additional guidance on how to determine, um, again, what the appropriate discipline should be. Um, Alejandra, Ann? Yes. So on the on what the companies do, you know, th this is, I should highlight, um, this is an area that companies struggle with. And it's how to, on the incentive side, right? It's, you know, we, we hear from our clients all the time is, why am I supposed to be incentivizing people to do what's right when that's my expectation, right? Um, the company has in place, the programs that, that Preston is alluding to are employee of the month recognition programs that we've seen deployed in Las Vegas and in Boston. Consistent with what we were discussing earlier of the company's focus on client service, most of to those types of issues, right? Employees who demonstrate exemplary client service, um, employees who think creatively or show excellence, which are the company's values, as, you, as you've seen in the report. What we would encourage the company to do and have made recommendations encourage that platform um, to integrate these types of value, the types of values that go to the human resources program. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, um, but you know, we, we certainly believe the company based on the foundation that it has on recognizes employees can build upon that. One critical point um, that the company is in process of developing is to build in incentives almost metrics or KPIs, if you will, in its performance management procedures of management on up that reflect that will include evaluation of how those leaders live the company's values and how they carry out their obligations under policies and procedures, including in this space. Um, our hope and, and expectation is that that will include factoring in that behavior into promotion opportunities, into um, discretionary bonus or salary, salary determinations. The most mature compliance programs incorporate those standards of behavior, that cultural um, commitment from its leadership into its performance management procedure system. Um, that is something that is just starting at the company. I'd say it's, you know, it's in its infancy, but we're encouraged by the fact that it's being led by a professional that has experience developing these types of procedures and who anticipates incorporating these types of values-based KPIs into the metrics by which management teams will be held accountable and assessed. On the disciplinary side, I think not, not much um, more to add there, um, except to say, again, we have seen, just to re reiterate the point from the investigations, that we have seen appropriate discipline um, carried out throughout the organization, including when it has involved more senior professionals. So that will take us to slide um, 14, and we'll, we'll start to speed along. We appreciate the fact that you've You've given us the benefit of a little bit more time here, um, but we'll, we will not take advantage of that. So this takes us to risk-based review. Um, you know, just as our evaluation and assessment of the program is based on the company's operational and human resources uh, risk profile, compliance, authority, compliance guidance from EEOC and the DOJ expect that companies will conduct ongoing risk-based assessments 
of their operations to identify where particular risks exist. Um, and this, Commissioner Suniga, goes straight to your point, right, is through this exercise, we expect that companies identify what is particular to their risk profile that requires um, particular resources or program design to be deployed to ensure those risks are mitigated. The company, as with most companies, has an enterprise risk management company uh, process. What we have not seen is our risk-based procedures led by either compliance or HR or legal designed to identify the specific human res resources risk that the company faces and how they materialize within the organization. That is something that we make recommendations about. We think um, the company can leverage other functions to help assist in that program. For example, security, and, and given the sensitivity of security protocols, we won't discuss those in detail, but based on our review and our interviews, we do see that physical security assessments take into account those isolated spaces we talked about earlier and what sorts of risks employees who work in those spaces um, can take. We think those protocols can more formally include harassment and discrimination risk as it pertains to the operations and can be leveraged in partnership with HR, um, legal and compliance to inform the, the compliance program. Internal audit also as part of its annual risk assessment looks at certain processes and we were pleased to see in an annual um, plan that it also issues of integrity and ethical values. This is an area that we did not delve into um, in the first phase, but we'll continue to monitor uh, and engage the company to understand how its internal um, audit procedures can be leveraged for human resources process. The company's review of sexual harassment and discrimination um, allegations on a weekly basis is one way the company does monitor risk and, and we should note that. The risk that's monitored under that mechanism, though, is risk that has already materialized. So it's it's a reactionary mm -hmm. um, response to risk. What we are encouraging the company to do here, again, consistent with uh, what we under what we know EOC and DJ guys expect, and what we see other companies, is create a bottom up risk assessment procedure so that you're engaging with employees at different functions to understand what their risks, that's much of what we did in the focus group and that can be deployed by the company through its own existing procedures as well. And of course, the outcome of that risk review should then be cyclically relied upon as the company monitors and updates its compliance program. Any, if there are any questions about risk-based reviews and what we've seen. And consistent with my use of the term monitoring, we're now going to move to monitoring and testing, which will take us to Anne. Yes, so this is closely related to what Alejandra was just talking about with the risk-based reviews, but we look specifically at monitoring and testing because we want to ensure that the company is self-evaluating its HRCP on a continual basis to make sure that the program itself is designed and implemented effectively. And in order for the HRCP to be successful in the long term, it's critical for it to be calibrated to the company's needs, not just now, but also in the future. And the way to do that is for the company itself to have a mechanism in place to continually be testing its own program over time. So this is something that's expected by the Department of Justice in their evaluation of compliance programs. And we also think it's critical um, to long-term success. So during the course of the last half year, um, we have not seen the company engage in a comprehensive systemic monitoring or testing of its HRCP. However, at the same time, we've observed that the company understands the importance of such activities and is investing in personnel and tools that can help to carry this out. So it will be a continued focus of ours um, throughout the monitorship. But to provide a couple of examples of what we've seen, um, first, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, the company does monitor reports of sexual harassment and discrimination. 
sexual harassment allegations and investigation updates go weekly to the company's general counsel and on a quarterly basis coupled with information on discrimination allegations this all goes to the compliance committee as well and this certainly provides detail and transparency to the general counsel and the compliance committee but it's uh, a retrospective look and consumes valuable resources so we will continue to look at whether that is sustainable in the long term or should be modified in some way second the the company has added certain bespoke questions to what has become an annual survey that it conducts, which is the Great Places to Work survey. And while these questions can provide overall impressions of employee perceptions of the company's HRCP, we encourage the company to conduct more targeted reviews as part of its monitoring and testing. For example, through more detailed surveys that focus specifically on HRCP related issues, um, or through focus group discussions. And the company should also test the effectiveness of its training program, as we've spoken about, um, and that kind of feeds into the long-term monitoring and testing. Third, we understand, as Alejandra mentioned, that internal audit does monitor and test certain aspects of the company's HRCP, and we anticipate looking further at this in the next phase of our assessment. Um, we also know, as has been discussed, that the company recently began to aggregate internal data that allows it to analyze trends and other important information points from investigations and otherwise. Um, and we understand that it intends to invest in systems that permit automated analysis, which will be very helpful from a resource perspective. So we look forward to seeing um, how the company implements this um, as the monitorship progresses. Overall, we would like to see a more systemic effort to test the HRCP by the company so that um, it can continue to calibrate its programs um, throughout the years. And we anticipate commenting more on this um, in the next phases. Thank you, Anne. One thing I realized I, I neglected to raise when we were talking about the Compliance Committee earlier on, the reports our, the reports on uh, sexual harassment discrimination allegations that are provided to the company, to the Compliance Committee quarterly, we understand both from interviews of the Compliance Committee members themselves, but more importantly from company personnel, that they are really diligently reviewed by the Compliance Committee. We understand from any given Compliance Committee, it could take you know a third of the time based on the level of questions that the Compliance Committee has about the nature of the allegations and more importantly from our standpoint the company's response to those allegations so you know while we you know don't want to completely under we don't want to leave an impression that it's not valuable um, they are the quarterly reports and the weekly reports are not just paper they are the company does engage with them in a meaningful way So that will lead us to um, a controls environment, which I, you know, I think we touched on um, the external management, the external council management, but of course, important to the MGC's decision and order was the company's use of confidentiality clauses, um, particularly with respect to, you know, what could be perceived as gag orders uh, imposed on claimants who raise sexual allegation concerns. As have modified confidentiality uh, clauses that are included in settlements. We've seen an instruction that was issued in September 2019 instructing the legal department um, particularly that confidentiality clauses could not preclude claimants from discussing the underlying facts of their allegations. We've seen template settlement agreements that include the clause that is accepted by the company. Um, again, we've only seen those in template form. We've not had the opportunity to review actual settlement agreements to confirm that the implementation of that uh, clause is being used consistently. We will note, you know, we say here that the changes made by the company only partially remediate the issue. And we view that in a couple of respects. First, from a controls perspective, the document that we've seen was an instruction memorandum advising that the clause was going to be changed. We think it's important, particularly given the history here, that the company explain and discuss um, 
why this is important um, and that it become a matter of company policy and procedure um, applicable to its legal department um, that these clauses are not going to be acceptable. HR should also be um, part of that conversation and, and training, if you will. Also, based on the language of the memorandum itself, it's not clear that the confidentiality clause must also be used in settlements of claims that arise, that, sorry, claims that are settled prior to the initiation of formal litigation. So as drafted and as we read the document, it applies to the settlement of formal legal claims. So lawsuit, EEOC um, complaint has been filed. There are, as we all know, settlement opportunities before matters turn into formal litigation or administrative procedures. And in fact, some of what the MGC looked to historically involve those types of claims. So it would be uh, important for the company to make clear that any employee settlement, even in a separation agreement to mitigate legal risk arising from allegations of sexual harassment or discrimination cannot be gagged and that this confidentiality clause applies to applies to those sorts of, of claims as well. And then lastly, um, but certainly not least important is similar to what we were talking um, about earlier, Madam Chair, with respect to the review of these types of processes, important that there be a formalized procedure that settlement agreements must be reviewed at a minimum, of course, by the general counsel, but optimally by someone like the CFO, given the sensitivity of these types of settlements. We'll continue to monitor, uh, again, more importantly, the implementation of these confidentiality clauses as we go along. And I think for the benefit of time, I'll just remind us what we discussed with respect to management of external counsel. And that is, again, just enhanced uh, opportunities to enhance the review process of external counsel engagements, and most importantly, uh, payment and approval of external counsel invoices. Any questions on, on those issues? So to conclude, I think, you know, the themes that, that we've tried to lay out here is, you know, really the company ought to be commended for its commitment and investment in its HRCP program. And it did demonstrate that commitment based on what we've seen even before we stepped in, which also reinforces our view that this is a sincere effort the company is making. Um, you know, we continue to see a commitment to build up its elements of the elements of its compliance program now and our recommendations are designed to help the company do that. We appreciate the reality that the company is receiving these recommendations at a very challenging time. And while, you know, typically we would as part of our recommendations impose timelines for certain recommendations to be implemented and completed, we have not done that here. We know when the company returns to its operations, it's going to be a heavy lift, to say the least. Um, we have no indication that the company views that as an excuse to delay compliance with our recommendations. In fact, I think as we pointed out earlier, the company has taken this time um, when employees are at home as an opportunity to start implementing some of the training recommendations that we've made, particularly to investigations. So, our commitment to you and to the company is that we will continue to push along, but we will do so in a way that is respectful of the reality that the company finds itself in right now, because at the end of the day, we do want the company's efforts to be meaningful and to stick. And that can only happen when operations normalize again. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, can I just ask my fellow commissioners if you have questions now for Alejandra and team? Uh, I, I do. Uh, thank you very much, Alejandra. This is a, a great uh, presentation and great uh, work reading your report that is, that is very detailed. Uh, it, it really comes through. Um, I want to I, I wanna just talk a little bit about uh, this, the general um, concept of uh, changing culture. Something that, uh, you know, 
can be probably easily dismissed by some, but it's really critical, uh, I would argue, um, and especially critical as you, you know, as you go through your report. Um, I, it brought me back to a, uh, a prior job, just reading through, through all of these. Uh, I was, uh, I worked at a, at a firm that was going through a big effort to change culture. Um, they, uh, this was a, a, a professional services uh, firm, a partnership that had traditionally put clients first and they had this big push to go to people first. They realized that, you know, as a partnership, only your consultants and managers and whatnot are your greatest greatest asset. And, uh, and there was a big push towards work-life balance. Um, it, it, uh, just to give you a quick example, and you touched on these with the incentives, a prior version or a prior uh, company that had been acquired by this partnership uh, if you build a hundred hours on a given week, you you got a phone call from the, from the owner himself. Mm. Uh, congr- so there was that culture of, of course, clients first. So anyway, um, that uh, uh, I was part of a, a large group of of you know trying to uh, implement those uh, changes to that culture, and. Um, my big insight uh, is as follows, and I guess this is what I'm asking to you either uh, sort of give us a little bit of your take on or, um, or expound. It really depended, depended this changing of culture uh, depended on the, the partner that you were talking about or the business unit. Even though the uh, the even though the the, the senior management and the, the leadership were really committed to making this shift uh, and and putting people first and having a work life balance, it sort of well you know once it came to the rubber hitting the road, again it was different depending on who you asked. Um, it also didn't happen overnight, and I think you alluded to it in your uh, in your report. Uh, but it kept it was this consistent. Uh, it, it became a tagline, really. It was everywhere, uh, people first and, and whatnot. Um, but also, and this is my the core of my question. It depended on people in the front lines, uh, people like me. Uh, I was a manager, but also people who reported to me, etc., and others to push back when, when told, you know, can you get this to me by, by tomorrow, which is the Friday before the long holiday weekend, to people to say, well, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna get to it. I'm gonna have to, you're gonna have to wait until, um, you know, until we all come back from uh, Memorial Day or whatever the case uh, may be. So um, can you, Speak a little bit to, to those three insight, uh, insights that I, uh, that I mentioned. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, it, it's great insight. And I, I realize we sh- yes, the, the time that it takes, you're absolutely right. This is not something that can meaningfully happen overnight. Is where if you see throughout the report, in the totality of the recommendations that we are recommending, it's to really force the company, and I don't think open to doing, but to really push the company to do deliberate, deliberate and steadfast in its approach to every element of the human resources program and with respect to every part of the company that it touches, which leads to the point of middle management. We spend a lot of time talking about tone at the top because of the history. But the program cannot survive. And part of what you know, I'm implying when we talk about embedding the program is exactly the point that you are making, which is the people who are on the floor, right, are supervisors and managers. The people that are receiving allegations of, of sexual harassment or discrimination are supervisors and managers. In fact, a, a majority of the employees that we talked to told us that that was gonna be their first line of defense to whom they would report allegations. Yes, it is critically important that as the company reinforces its training, that it focus on 
supervisors to almost to exhaustion communicate what is expected of them. And by the way, part of that is also this notion of what customer service, what client service means and doesn't mean, because the comments that we heard with that perception cut across focus groups that included line employees and managers and supervisors. So very important for people who are making real-time decisions on how to re respond to offending behavior, understand what the company's expectations are, and understand that they themselves will be held accountable for failing to do that, which is something we've seen the company communicate, but which we believe the company must do consistently, deliberately. And as they continue to evolve their performance management program, it should be an area that is pushed down to, to, to management supervisors and managers as goals, right? Not just you can't hold somebody accountable at the end if you haven't specifically stated that this will be an objective and a criteria under which they will be managed. So critically important for the company as it sets objectives for its supervisors and managers to incorporate these types of compliance elements into it. In speaking to what the company is doing and can leverage already with respect um, to that, as part of the surveys that Anne mentioned, the Great Places to Work survey, the company took back those results and tasked managers and supervisors with developing action plans, which is important in two ways. One, it demonstrates this isn't just a survey to get a rating. The company is internalizing it. And it's giving the departments, it heads, the ownership of developing action plans along with teams to remediate and respond to areas of noted improvement in the survey responses that they got. That's the type of deliberate action, um, Commissioner Suniga, that we refer to in response to your question, the company needs to continue to do. It has to be a priority year over year, um, not just for HR, but the operations at large to be vigilant on these issues and how it communicates and holds its teams accountable for that. Did I speak to your, you said three points, did I cover the three? Absolutely, no, absolutely. Okay. And uh, and I should mention that you also pronounced my last name with the exact pronunciation, so I appreciate that too. And you pronounce my first name with the exact same pronunciation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, any uh, further questions for the Miller team? I have one uh, question outstanding. Yeah. Um, Okay, Madam Chair, just, just two questions or two comments to, um, to wrap up some things I saw in the report. Um, some of this goes to culture. In the, in the report, you stress a lot of the company's kind of conflict between their core values and their core behaviors. Um, are you making recommendations to them on trying to balance those out? Or are there other examples you can share with them to kind of... Um, reduce that contention between the two? We've made a high level recommendation um, to, so for those who haven't had the benefit of reading the report on the phone, there are values, core values that the company promotes, and then there are longer lists of standards of behavior that the company also promotes and expects from its employees. The incongruence is the values, as you've heard us speak to, don't really reflect what the standards of behavior which speak to respect, integrity, transparency. So one of the recommendations is to incorporate those sorts of um, issues into the values, but also more importantly, I think, is for the company to uh, focus in more clearly on the standards of behavior that are most critical to it as it tries to uh, define its culture. It's a very long list right now. Um, and to be most effective, they have to be you know, punchy and they have to be remembered and they have to be something that employees can truly understand so that they can be held accountable to that. It's not uncommon for companies to have values and standards of behavior, but what's important and we're not seeing here is that they're promoted equally and that they're talked about equally so that employees understand to the extent that the values don't change, right? Excellence, creativity, client service. It's not to be 
seen as above or having greater importance to the standards of behavior that go to how you treat each other and how you behave as part of the Wynn family. If I so can add, to, just, just one, one suggestion that we have made in discussions with the company um, is in, along the lines of what Alejandro is describing, is making sure that just as a community, uh, as the company, as the head of the company uh, in, in Boston talks about the importance of customer service, um, that uh, they also talk about the importance of uh, how customers uh, treat uh, employees and, and uh, the commissioners and that, this is uh, consistent with what you described as people first. Um, um, and that is that's something that we've talked to uh, about uh, with them and I think it will continue to be a focus. Thank you. I appreciate that. The, the other question I had is obviously we're finding ourselves in a new environment. Do you anticipate or do you have the opportunity to kind of review some of the uh, the training practices, knowing that hopefully in a short period of time, employees will be coming back, uh, may need some refreshers about policies, or might be even some new employees we don't know yet. Um, are you tailoring your work to kind of monitor some of the different work that the company has planned, especially here in Boston, to um, engage their employees in the reopening? Yes, um, in two ways. One, in Preston, I think alluded to this earlier, is ensuring that given the clearly urgent priorities that face the company right now, that, that those do not come for the commitment that we've to its program so that it continues priority. And that within the current environment, it find opportunities to communicate and reinforce the culture. And yes, we will be looking at one, I mean, one thing that as you asked the question, you know, we also have to think about how training will be conducted going forward. We, you know, we heard in Las Vegas, employees go into huge auditoriums, right? And, um, and experience live training. So I think that's something that certainly will have to be reevaluated, but we will be tailoring our next phase. It, it will by necessarily change based on the current conditions, both from a just practical standpoint and also substantively uh, issues that arise in the new reality. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you. Other just, questions? I, I do actually, just uh, in conclusion, I did wanna also just reiterate my thanks to you and the team and the, the level of work and detail that went into not only gathering the information, but the, the written analysis. Um, the big, takeaway I have in terms of going forward and as Commissioner Seven said what that will look like obviously remains to be seen um, but their company has come quite a long way in terms of correcting itself and implementing some of these things particularly in the HR arena but it also seems to still be very personality and skills driven and you have an incredibly experienced set of GCs in Boston and Las Vegas and you comment on some of the labor intensive aspects of them being able to do this. Um, but I trust that in going forward, the push for the company to make sure that's institutionalized in terms of making sure that if for some reason those personalities change, particularly with the uncertainties going forward, this ground isn't lost and that you know it's not going to slip off the course that it's on right now. Critically, yes, 100%. And that we see, we've seen that in other organizations where you put exactly the profile of people that we're seeing here right now, right? Which are people of integrity who have respectful and long careers that earn the authority that is required for a company to change that. And I say that for Boston and Las Vegas equally. Um, but yes, they, they do move on. <laughs> and that is why, you know, we reiterate this idea of embedding and institutionalizing and formalizing procedures so that they are not tied to specific personalities because that it would be a waste of all of the efforts for you know you see programs fall like a house of cards i've seen that firsthand when the people who built them leave an organization 
Um, and we well, and, and part of the benefit of doing this, you know, for a number of years is that you do get to see some cycles, right? We've we've seen one of the people who most impressed us, quite frankly, was the legal trainer that conducted the uh, trainings that most of us sat through, and we were truly blown away from how effective she is, or she was. It's going to be hard to fill those shoes. So the company has to ensure that the training program is alive and independent from the person who's designing it and developing and delivering it. So I, I thank you again. I wish everyone a nice long weekend coming up and I thank you for your work. Thank you very much for your time and, and support. Happy weekend to you too. Yes, thanks very much. Before, I just had before one, we leave, yeah, oh, I, and oh, Commissioner sorry, Cameron, one, I do just, have comments. Go ahead. Yeah, I just had one comment, and that is, um, and that is, uh, it appears that you've taken on this responsibility in a very constructive manner, which I think is uh, a key element of being successful in the role. And it also appears to me that the company has um, has also looked at this as a constructive. Um, uh, you know, peace and are taking it uh, seriously and are, uh, you know, I don't know if welcoming is too strong a word, but certainly um, seriously looking to make, um, uh, to implement the kind of recommendations uh, that you are suggesting. And I, I commend both of you for those efforts. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and your perception of the company's engagement in this is absolutely accurate. So uh, are there any other com uh, comments or questions from my fellow commissioners? Okay, I just have one question. Um, Anne, actually, do you mind returning the screen, please? Because then I can see everybody. It's actually there we go. helpful to me. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, it's a process question, Alejandra. Can, uh, I want to make sure that all the fellow, my fellow commissioners understand that you did distribute the report to the company in advance yeah. and and for what purpose the specific purpose um first we we provided it to the company on a read only in a read only format and the specific reason was to make sure that factual statements that we were making assumptions upon which we were relying were accurate um but, we did not we specifically asked the company oh, i'm sorry no, just your, the word factual just didn't come through, but I think you said factual. Factual, yeah. yes. So any factual representations that we were making, we wanted to make sure for everyone's benefit and the integrity of this process, um, we didn't get that wrong. We were very clear that we would not take into consideration any substantive changes to our observations, to our recommendations, um, unless, of course, they were on completely erroneous <laughs> grounds. Um, we do appreciate the fact that the company respected that line. The comments that we received back were very thoughtful, given the length of the report. I can appreciate how long that must have taken them, especially working remotely, and really were designed to clarify um, factual inaccuracies or better explain the facts that we were trying to, to drive forward. So we do, we appreciate that. And that is something typical that we would do um, in these procedures is to make sure that the monitored entity has the opportunity to to review the document precisely for those purposes. And in fact, none of our observations and none of our recommendations were 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 touched. Thank you. I think it's just really important to um, emphasize that the role of the independent monitor is is that of independence. And I and I I feel as though we from the Gaming Commission's perspective and from Wynn's perspective have safeguarded that independence yeah. and appreciate very much um, the product that you've submitted today, uh, both in the PowerPoint and the report. Um, <clears throat> I've become self-conscious now in terms of how I pronounce anybody's name, but uh, <laughs> Mon <laughs> Monitor um, Montenegro Alamante, uh, Deputy Monitor Pew and Ms. Salton, thank you for your um, 
excellent presentation, thorough presentation to the entire um, Miller Chevalier uh, the team. Thank you. I do want to just uh, end with a few of my own observations. I really want to commend Wynn and the Encore Boston Harbor team for, as we've noted, the continued collaborative approach to this process. Wynn and Encore cooperated, cooperated um, and facilitated the monitor's uh, team's ability to review the documents extensively, conduct interviews, and um, engage in employee-focused groups, not only here in Boston, but in Nevada. Uh, the independent review underscored Wynn's diligence in developing and implementing the robust human resource compliance program that we've heard about. And they've also, the review identified helpful recommendations for refinement. And as Commissioner Cameron noted, it's all constructive moving forward. Uh, <clears throat> effective HR protocols and procedures matter because fundamentally, as we noted in our hearing and in our decision, that at their core, it is the health and safety and well-being of the people that they address. Those people are at the heart of every organization and who the rules are designed to protect. This has always been true, but it would be remiss if I didn't note that we now feel this profoundly given the global pandemic. In the early days of the COVID outbreak in the months since, the WIN organization has led by example, guiding thoughtful discussion across industries and generously sharing the best practices devised by leading public health experts. They have distinguished themselves at the forefront of the industry response, prioritizing health and safety above all else. And despite the extended closure, WIN has continued to pay all employees plus gratuities through May 31st. This is the leadership that leads, that is representative of a world-class organization. Encore has demonstrated its civic commitment, donating supplies, we know, to the community and lifting spirits in Boston with messages in Everett and from Boston's viewpoint, messages of encouragement displayed on the property's facade. The baseline study sets forth productive recommendations that support the advancement and maturation of existing policies, consistent with WIN's own core values of always finding room for improvement. The independent monitor selection and appointment Appointment and selection was a principal condition of the commission's April 29 decision and order. Our decision states that the MGC was to select that independent monitor, appoint that monitor with the company's full cooperation and at the company's expense. We thank Miller and Chevalier for that, their comprehensive work and to win for its continued cooperation the gaming industry's success here in the Commonwealth relies on the health, safety, and well-being of its employees more than ever going forward. That's critical. We're pleased that all of us share that goal and that we're advancing it in a sustainable fashion. So thank you. Um, we don't need to have, we don't have to say safe flight home, um, but we do ask that you stay safe in, in, in your homes and um, have a nice long, long weekend. Same to you. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, and, and our best to you as well. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. To my fellow commissioners, we're still on. Um, we're uh, have finished item number six. Do we have any other business from our fellow commissioners that you'd like to note? I'll I'll go in order. Commissioner Cameron. Up. Oh. You're muted. I do not have any uh, additions, but thank you for asking. Okay, thank you. Commissioner O'Brien? No, I have nothing, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Zinica? Uh, just a quick update that I will be coming back with a further update on a, a meeting of the Public Health Trust Fund uh, that is scheduled next week. Um, uh, we, uh, we are trying to and intend to uh, discuss uh, budget. Uh, in time to come back to the commission um, before the end of the fiscal year with its own implications for our own budget. But um, that meeting is uh, scheduled for this coming Wednesday. And again, I'll be coming back with additional uh, updates, I think. 
And our, our fellow commissioners are permitted to attend. We just don't participate. Absolutely. Thank you. We, we anticipate uh, the same kind of uh, technology uh, that we use. Uh, that we have now, you know, very well uh, put together uh, with our um, uh, Zoom type uh, phone call and sharing agendas. And, and, and Commissioner Stebbins, do you have any additional item? Uh, I do not, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And Chair says aye. Thank you, 5-0. Have a nice long weekend, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy.